Good afternoon, members. Um, you're very welcome to November's planning committee meeting. I'm going to pass over to Maura now to take the roll call. Thank you, Chair. Members, you're hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the planning committee Wednesday, the 4th of November at 2 p.m. Councillor Jason Barr. Councillor Jason Barr. I can see you. Here, Mara. Yeah. Mara, can you hear me? Councillor John Boy. Hello. Councillor John Boy. Yeah, I'll go back to Jason Barr, Councillor Jason Barr. Yep, here, Mara. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. No, I'll wait that one. Alderman Alan Breslin. Here. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Thank you, Angela. Um, Councillor Paul Gallagher. Councillor Paul Gallagher. And Shaw. Councillor Sean Harkin. Councillor Sean Harkin. Here, sorry. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. And Shaw. Councillor Dan Kelly. And Shaw. Thank you. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Come back. Uh, Alderman Hollery McClintock. Here, Mara. Thank you, Hillary. Councillor Kieran McGuire. Hello, Mara. Thank you, Kieran. Councillor Philip McKinney. Here, Maura. Yes, well, thank you. Councillor Aileen Mellon. And Sean, Maura. All right, Aileen, have you. Councillor Sean Minnie. Here, Maura. Thank you. Just go back three members and check. Councillor John Boyle. He's having difficulty, Maura. He's having difficulty trying to get on. He is trying. I can see him now. Uh, All right, thank you, Councillor Boyle. Um, I'll just go back on Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Just one last call. No, nope, I'm not getting anything. Okay, thank you, members. Um, thank you, Maura. Um, Members, um, going to read the broadcasting statement. Um, I'd like to remind everyone who is in remote, remote attendance that this meeting will be broadcast live via Council's YouTube channel and will be available for viewing by the public and the media. The broadcast will also be available for repeated viewing at a later date. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with Council protocol. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to request to speak. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting to be informed and to the use and the storage of these images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. A, council, a copy of Council's privacy notice may be found on the Council website. Thank you, members. Um, members, can I ask for a declaration of members' interests? Chair, can I declare an interest on item eight? Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Mellon. Chair. Is there any further declarations of interest? Chair, one on the, the TPOs. Who, who's that, Councillor Gallagher? Yes, Paul Gallagher. 
Thank you. Um, Alderman Breslin? Yes, you hear. Here? Yeah. Are you declaring an interest, Alderman Breslin? No. Okay. Oh, you're just registering your attendance? Yeah. 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 Um, members, going to move on now to um, the chairperson's business. There's a number of items that I uh, want to raise on, on the chairperson's business. The first... Um, is in relation to correspondence um, that members would have received today. Um, I am going to refer that correspondence um, to confidential business. So in relation to the correspondence emails that was received today, um, I am going to, I'm, I'm going, if there's any queries or questions in relation to that, um, I'm asking members to, to keep them until we're in confidential business. Um, Members, in your pack today, um, there's an item, item number 15. Um, it's a re-advertisement of the Fermanagh and Oma District Council Local Development Plan draft strategy. Um, there's proposed changes um, and the consultation. I'm going to, it's unconfidential for decision. Um, I'm going to move that and, and, uh, and the open for decision, just to make members aware. So item number 15 will come on the open business. Um, members, I have received an, a request to defer an application in light of the current pandemic, um, which I have discussed with the, the head of planning, so, um, which we have agreed. So it's item number seven, um, we have agreed that um, that application will be deferred and I'm going to pass over to Maura now um, to take you through the running order and the late information. Thank you, Chair. Members, this afternoon the running order is item two, item four, item five, item one, Item three, item six, and item eight. The first three items have speakers, just so you know, and that's item two, four, and five. Um, in terms of late items, members, you will have already been circulated um, two late items, and they both relate to item number four, and that is a direction of a dwelling and garage and a farm at southwest of 18 Lickford Road, Strabane. Um, one late item is an email from the agent, and the second email is from Councillor Boyle. Both will be in front of you before um, the, the, the meeting to, has started. So um, today, that's all we have in terms of late items. And that's run in order. So thank you, Chair. I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Maura. Um, and members, just um, what has been uh, what what we've got into the practice now of. Um, of taking any late information prior to that application. So whenever we um, we get an application which is relating to the late information, um, we'll take a minute or two for members to familiarize themselves with the late correspondence. Um, members, I'm going to move on now to the matters arising from the open minutes of the planning committee held remotely on Wednesday the 7th of October. Any matters arising, members? Councillor Harkin. Thanks, Chair. Is my camera on there? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is a, this is agenda item six, um, and it is P one two four slash twenty scheme of delegation, um, where we discussed the uh, uh, issue of the HMOs and the ammonia emissions. 
can I request that uh, the discussions that we had be made uh, available to us, but also to be made available to um, uh, all councillors? I think that there are issues that I think many people would need to be aware of, um, and I, I would just like to get that on paper so I have clarity around uh, some of those discussions. Uh, the, the, the number of HMOs, for example, that are now being put in for um, uh, late uh, 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 passage or authorization. Uh, I think we were all we, we all raised an eyebrow about that, and and there was an issue about streets going over what the uh, percentage, the recommended percentage is, um, and there, we've had a discussion about ammonia as well. So if I could request that that be put on paper, be made available to us and to uh, the rest of the councillors, I think that would be very useful. Okay, Councillor Hogan, just for clarity. Um what you, are you requesting that the current schema delegation um, is made available, or do you want a summary of the um, the, the, the 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 points that were discussed at an informal meeting? Yeah, I I, I think that um, that the, the points that were discussed at the informal meeting, I think we should put that uh, you know make that formal, put that on paper. So, and I and I think that there's issues there that were, are not just of concern to the planning committee, but I think that people need to uh, have access to that beyond the planning committee. So, the the contents of those informal discussions, they weren't decision making meetings. Obviously, um, I think that we were just being given information that we would need to look at. So, um, I think it would be useful to have that uh, put into a formal kind of mechanism. Well, I ask the head of planning to respond to that. Um, Chair, I just want to remind members that the purpose of that discussion wasn't about the content, but it was about procedures in terms of whether or not members wished for some cases to be brought forward into the committee or remain as delegated. The the detail on around that, you know, it was a general discussion about the types of applications um, rather than giving members advice. Um, because we would have done if we were given them detailed advice, that certainly would have been brought into the committee as a as a paper as we normally would. But it was really a discussion on the merits of whether something remained in committee or as delegated. Um, I suppose that would be what I would be advising at this point, Chair. But we can Chair. provide bullet points on the, the, the main um, areas and, and topics that was covered at the, in the discussion from, from what I recall. Um, but it was an informal discussion, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I bring Philip on? Well, yeah, a uh, chair. Um, just and um, Councillor Harkin will can confirm. But if if it's in relation to the discussion which took place at the council meeting on the or at the committee meeting on the eighth of October, um, just to remind members that that meeting in its entirety, um, and in terms of the open business, is available on the council YouTube channel. Uh, and is available for any anybody, any elected member or any member of the public to view exactly what was discussed. Um, but maybe he's referring to a separate informal meeting that I, I wasn't party to. But if it's in relation to the, the planning committee meeting, certainly that, that is available on the YouTube. All of that is there. Um, Councillor Hargan, do you want to come back in? I'm assuming you're yeah. referring to the the informal meeting we had to discuss the scheme delegation. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I, I think what Maura said there would be acceptable if we could just have, have a bullet point kind of summary of what we discussed at the informal meeting. That would be that would be acceptable to me. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hergen. Um, is there any other matters arising?
Thanks, Hogan. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, this is in relation to um, LA slash 2019 slash 0318 slash F. Um, and I just want to note that uh, I, I received and I think all the other members of the committee received and the uh, Bannon officers also received correspondence re regarding this uh, that raised some concerns that would be of a concern for the council. And I just want to make that noted that we've received that correspondence and that people have had an opportunity to look at it. We don't have to have a discussion about it now, but I, I think we should, uh, we should note that it's been sent in. Um, and flagged. Okay. Any um, further comments, members? So um, we're going to move on to the matters arising from the open minutes of the reconvened planning committee meeting held on the 8th of October. The matters arising, members? No. Members, just um there's just something I want to pick up on and and coming out of those meet minutes, it's in relation to the site visits. Um members we agreed that um it wouldn't uh, we acknowledge that it wouldn't be appropriate at this minute in time um they hold they hold the site hold site visits in relation to any applications. Um, I'm going to suggest that um, that we continue with with that approach, um, and we ask officers to continuously keep that under review. <coughs> so, um, if members are content that we move forward on that basis, yeah. Members, moving on to the planning application list. Um, and as Maura has outlined, um, the uh, first application that's, um, that's in front of us today is LA 11 2018 forward slash F. It's number two in your pack. And it's it's the retention of a change of use, the children's recreational activity space. And it's Malgi that's going to take us through there. See that, members? Maggie, there is there's, there's a grey box on the screen. Um, I know this is an issue that we experienced before. I can see most of the presentation, but I'm just... It's gone. Where is it? Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, oh, go on ahead, Matt. That's, that's great. Thanks, uh, Maggie. Thank Thank you, Chair. Um, item two is uh, an application LA 11 2018 05 f and the proposal is for the retention of change of use to children's recreational activity space and cafe area on e mezzanine from a furniture warehouse. Um, the site is located at Unit 2 Business Park, uh, Elec Business Park, Derry, and the recommendation is to refuse. Um, the site is uh, located to show in red and the, the attached site location plan. It's unit two. Maggie. Maggie, just before you proceed, um, I am finding that I'm struggling to pick up everything you're saying. Can you move, maybe move a wee bit closer? Um, okay, can you hear me now? Uh, that's better. Thank you. Okay. Um, site is located in, as in red and the attached site location plan. Um, unit two is a central unit with uh, a number of uh, um, 
units from the Elec Business Park. Uh, the site is located within uh, zoned industrial land as part of the area, area plan. Um, as shown in the attached image is the, the purple area, uh, zoned as uh, AMB3, um, Elec Business Park in the area plan 2011. Um, it's approximately 14 hectares of zoned industrial land uh, and the intention of this land was for uh, industrial development uses. Um, the relevant plan policy is set out before you, uh, the RDS, the Dairy Area Plan. And particularly within the Dairy Area Plan, we have the zoning AND free. We also consider AND policy AND free also. Um, we have the strategic plan policy statement for Northern Ireland, um, PPS4, uh, and also the clarification on PDD7 of PPS4. Um, PPS2 in terms of natural heritage, PPS3 in terms of access, movement, and parking, and PPS15 in terms of flood planning and flood risk. Um, the central concern uh, with this application is on the proposed use uh, and the loss of uh, industrial or economic land. Um, this is laid out in a number of policy contexts, but particularly in the dairy area plan. Um, policy AND free of the dairy area plan states that um, will normally approve the plan will normally approve industrial development in existing industrial estates so to make full use of existing infrastructure. Um, as I say, the site is, is located within zoning AND free. Um, it seeks to ensure the policy is to ensure that um, the land is currently used or last used. Um, for industrial or economic uses will be retained um, for that use wherever appropriate. Um, this proposal is for a sui generis leisure use, uh, would, um, would not be considered an industrial or economic development use. Um, therefore, it is our opinion the proposal phase comply with policies AND1 and AND3 of the dairy area plan. Um, PPS4 is the the regional plan policy statement uh, in relation to economic development uses. Uh, and again, it gives more detailed advice in terms of plan and policy, and in particular on uh, plan policy, which leads to the, the loss of land or building zoned for economic use. So PED7 is the is the, the main policy in this respect. Um, it's clearly sets out to that we should avoid um, proposals which will result in the loss of zoned land, unless the zoned land has been substantially developed for alternative uses. Um, in terms of context, um, um, Elec Business Park, um, as well as being zoned, has an outline approval, which allowed a number of uh, uses under the use plan and use class order, which would be considered economic or industrial uses, including uh, light industrial, general industrial, uh, and storage and distribution. So, as well as the zoning, there is an, an approved outline application for the entire site. PED7 permits an exception where the development of a sui generis employment use, where it can be demonstrated that proposal is compatible with the predominant land industrial use. is of a scale, nature, and form appropriate to location, and approval will not lead to a significant diminution of the, the employment land resource in the locality or the plan area in general. Um, it further gives advice in particular to retailing and commercial leisure developments, which the proposal before us falls into that category. It states that they will not be permitted except where justified as acceptable ancillary development. Um, so we believe that the, the current proposal would result in the loss of zone, land zone free economic development use to set out. Um, we have noted that there are some non-conforming uses operating within the zone, um, but these we do not believe that there's been has been developed substantially for alternative uses. When under consideration is set out in PED seven, um, this is a leisure development facility, which is not an acceptable and solid development to the current industrial uses with Van Eyck Business Park, and the proposed use and its nature and scale would be. Will be on what we would describe as in sorry, and we believe it's uh, designed to attract customers from a wide area beyond the industrial zoning. 
Um, and attached also to the, the PPS for consideration, we've also considered uh, plan the, the SPPS, um, which deals with uh, consideration of town center uses. Um, and it sets out a description of what would be considered a town center use uh, in, a, in a wider plan and sense. Uh, and leisure uses as, set, as proposed would come under that description. So as such, um, paragraph 6.28 over the SPPS states that a sequential test should be applied to plan applications for main town centre uses that are not an existing centre or not in accordance with an updated LDP. Um, it also points out that plan authorities should adopt a town centre first approach when considering applications for main town centre type uses. Um, the proposal is a commercial leisure development in accordance with the SPPS. This Type of use should be located within the city centre as defined by the dairy area plan. The dairy area plan defines both a commercial core and central area, uh, and therefore, you know, it, it, it includes a wide area um, of both, uh, both sides of the river foil and a central location in the city. The site is located uh, on zoned industrial land within an existing industrial state uh, on the outskirts of the city. It's not within the central area or commercial core. And it's not considered to be an age of centre location. Um, the agent has provided a list of properties for the commercial core and centre area um, with the potential to accommodate the proposal. Um, whilst the agent has stated that these are not uh, appropriate for the proposed use, one of the properties may have the potential to accommodate the proposal with some alterations. Um, again, that list would not be exhausted if that's the list that's been provided by the agent. Therefore, considering the SPPS, the proposal for the main point center type use of location, we believe is contrary to paragraphs 6.20 to 6.282 of the SPPS. We've also considered a number of other policies relating to the proposal itself. Policy B, one of the area plan, considered design in general from the development elements of the, the city. And proposals are required to make a positive contribution. Um, this is an application of attention of change of use. There's no really discernible differences in terms of the development from the from the outside. Uh, therefore, we believe overall that it's compatible with the policy requirements of policy BE1. Um, SPPS deals with uh, residential immunity. Um, again, it's just the planning system should operate in the public interest of local communities and it talks about the question of uh, the unacceptable effect of the owners or occupants of neighbourhood properties. Uh, so we, we have assessed it. Um, the main issue of concern in this application was the potential for noise uh, emission uh, emanating from the, 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 the proposal, given the nature of the, 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 the use. Um, the applicant has demonstrated through a noise assessment that the mitigation measures would consult with environmental health and were satisfied that uh, there would be no impact on immunity of uh, the neighbouring properties. In this case, uh, there is no residential properties within close proximity, but we have also considered the impact on the, 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 the uses uh, immediately either side of the proposal. Um, the FA rules have been consulted in terms of PPS3. Um, there, there's no issues uh, and in terms of uh, access movement to parking. We've also considered PPS2, um, which our ASS has been carried out, the EIA determination carried out, and uh, there's no potential for uh, detrimental impact from the nature of this proposal. Um, the drainage that there's no areas of flood risk have been identified at the site, although it's near uh, flood risk areas, it's, it's just falls outside and a, a drainage assessment is not required because it's a change use application. So, um, it beats PPS 2 and PPS 15. We've received one representation, there's been one letter of objection uh, or the proposal. The issues raised include the, the design of the premises, the access to and, through, to, to and from the premises. Acoustics um, emanating from the premises and uh, 
the compatibility of the use adjoining uh, an engineering premises and, and, and a general locality. So, in conclusion, um, we um, have considered the application against the relevant planning policies and the area plan, PKS4 and ASPPS. Uh, and as the proposals for commercial use located on zone land, we believe that the, if allowed, will lead to a loss of industrial land within zone industrial land. And um, the proposals are not considered to be compatible to generous use. And we do not believe that uh, the, 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 the nature of the zoning has changed over the planning period to an extent that, the, that it would meet the, the exception in PEB 7. And again, plus given the nature of the proposal, it's a, a, a commercial area use, PPS4, um, Hickory, and um, points out that those uses will not be acceptable. And again, we've uh, believed it doesn't meet the SPPS in terms of the, the nature of the use and the, 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 the policy direction that such uses should be since, uh, located for fund point center or point center uh, locations. So, overall on balance and proposal is recommended to be contrary to planning policy and refusal is recommended and the, the refusal reasons are set out before you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Augie. Um, can I invite Liam Nellis from the addressing committee? Thanks, Councillor Jackson. Uh, thank you, Maliki, and uh, hello to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. So you're very, you're very welcome, Liam. Liam, just Thanks. just to remind you, um, you have five minutes to make your comments. Perfect. Thanks a million. Thanks. Sir. Well, look, uh, thank you, Maliki, for setting it a very uh, well, um, uh, a well documented um, case officer report on the application. I suppose. <laughs> For quite a while now, and there have been a number of battles from um, from our own perspective mm -hmm. in terms of trying to get this operational and as as clean cut as we can. And I think that really, when it comes down to it, uh, we're really only down to the two refusal reasons, which are the the laser use that would reduce the loss of land, which is zoned for industrial, um, and also then that the uh, sui generis commercial laser couldn't be located within the commercial core. So I suppose. Um, for me, uh, I may start at the first one on this, and what I would say is that uh, this uh, industrial or light industrial land that's been here, um, it's well known and well documented that this building in particular has laid vacant for a very, very long time. Um, and in that instance, the client uh, had looked at this as an opportunity to try and bring some employment to what was effectively um, uh, a disused building in that area. Now, um, what I did notice, and I'm sure it was completely accidental, that on the case officer's report, um, there was reference made to applications within the area uh, of similar stature and, and nature. Uh, one of the applications, however, that was missed from that report was application LA11 2016-0412, which was just across the way, Unit 3 uh, of uh, Elite Business Park. And that was an application that I myself was the agent for back in 2016. And that involved the retention of a door sale shop on the ground floor and a gymnasium on the first floor, which actually was approved um, in that area. And again, the at that time, very particularly around the fact that, you know, there was such a high uh, percentage rate of units that were um, uninhabited at that stage. That was a very uh, significant point uh, in that argument. So again, with this one, we're looking at a uh, building which had laid vacant for a very long time. There's not a lot of uh, light industrial uses popping up or in fact being um, developed or um, uh, residents moving into anywhere across the whole council area. So I think in this instance, um, you know, I, th I find that um, pretty harsh, to be quite honest. Um, particularly with the application that we're referring to here. Now, th this type of application, I'm, I'm lucky with my work that I travel a lot across the UK and Ireland. And, in pretty much every city or town that I've ever been where units like this are around, they're always on the, the hinterland of the town simply because you just do not have accommodation that has the required size and uh, and head height in this instance for uh, development such as this. Now, this one, 
Uh, we did carry out a sequ sequential test at the time, and I know that on the planning report it suggested that, that 113 to 115 spent per road was suitable. Now, that wasn't suitable, and the reason that it wasn't suitable was because the works that were required to carry it out, i.e. removal of a full structural deck on this floor, uh, and that structural deck was also um, uh, uh, like part of the overall structure, so it's not just a matter of peeling back a floor. Uh, there was hugely significant structural alterations required, which obviously made this, from an economic point of view, completely uh, unachievable. Um, as well as that, I suppose from you know a, a separate but a commercial point of view, because ultimately you know all of these businesses have to be commercial. Um, you've also got another facility quite like this on the uh, BT forty seven side of the water. There are none of this uh, of this type uh, on the on the city side, so uh, really, then you look at that, and I know the policy will dictate in terms of the town, but I think as a collective, as a council, and as a as a committee, we also have to be very acutely aware that we need to serve uh, the community in terms of its location across the full jurisdiction of, of the of the city and the and the townland. So I think for us, my point on it will be quite uh, simple on it, in, in the sense that the first plan. I'm, uh, point in terms of the light industrial and the use down there. There are no light industrial uses available, and the fact that that lay vacant for so long really is testament to that. Um, 2016, we did have a, a, a positive outcome on a similar application for a gymnasium on the very same part of the town. Um, and then the sequential test then, which again, the sequential test is something that's very, very prominent in terms of reaching outcomes uh, when we look at the SPPS across applications such as this. Um, and for me, I think that carries a heavily or a very significant weight in this instance. There are no other areas for a, um, a product like this or a, a service like this in the town. Um, this is the single only site that this is available on. We've looked extensively at the planning or at the parking. We've looked extensively at the noise. All of the various consultants have been brought on board from traffic, parking, acoustic, and all of those tests have been passed and passed quite easily. Um, so for me, when we boil it down to what the two refusal reasons are, I think that they're quite harsh. And I think that the committee, I would urge the committee to look at this in terms of the delivery of a service to the city side, which isn't available otherwise, the creation of the jobs, and the fact that this building will go back to lie vacant and will probably lie vacant for a very long time if we remove if we remove a use at the minute that is creating all of those jobs and and um, and enjoyment for for the for the young ones. Um, that's all I have to say, folks. But I'm happy to take any questions if there's any there. Thank you, Liam. Um... Members, is there any questions for Mr. Nunes? No. Can you hear me? Members. Christopher? Yeah. Who, chair, can you hear? On yes, ahead. Chair. Yes, on Chair. Ahead. Uh, yeah. I have one question for him, if I may. Uh, how many uh, jobs would this actually bring into the area? Okay, Liam, just before you come on, um, the answer in the questions, can I ask you to turn on your, your video? And, and Malgi, can I request that the presentation's taken down as well? Councillor? Yeah, yeah, go on ahead, Liam. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. So the, the facility at the moment has created 12 part-time jobs, um, which are shift works effectively. I've lost them there. Yeah, all of the spaces are timetabled. And the reason for that is for twofold. Number one, they uh, control the flow of people in and out of it uh, for management and and um, and obviously for safety reasons. Uh, and then secondly, it yeah. allows them. Yeah. Liam, can you just uh, we we'll lost you for a wee bit there? So, seeing in relation to the jobs, um, can we can you pick up there again? I just I know I, 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 I you cut out me for when and I know um, Councillor McKenna said the same thing. So. Just that, okay. so apologies for about them, but um, there was an, it was a key element of the question. So, um, in terms of how many jobs are created, 
Yes. So apologies for that, folks. Um, the jobs created are 12 part-time jobs and there are four full-time jobs. The four full-time jobs are up in the, the cafe area and the 12 part-time jobs are down below. The way this facility works, councillor, is that the children are timetabled for one-hour slots. And that's the reason for that's twofold. Number one, for them, they manage the amount of people coming in and out for management reasons, but also for safety reasons. Uh, that also obviously helps control the flow of traffic in and out of the place because you can't come in unless you're booked into it. So yes, in answer to your question, 16 jobs in total, four of which are full-time and 12 of which are part-time. Chair, thank you. Chair, thank you, Flood. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, any other questions, members? No. John here, John Boyd. Right, members, can I ask you to um, type on the chat box if you want to indicate to speak, no, and turn on and turn on your video as well. Go ahead, Councillor Boyd. My apologies, Chair. I'm having all manner of IT difficulties today, so uh, I'm hoping you're even able to hear. A qu quick question for Liam. Uh, Liam, how long has this, um, this business been in operation in this location? Thanks, Councillor. Uh, this, uh, this business has been in operation. Uh, Yeah, that's that's fine. I don't know if I don't make connections. Okay, no, I just want to know how to. Thank you. Thank you. No, no problem. Uh, we got you, Liam. Um, any other questions, members? No. Thank you, Liam. Um, questions, to officer. Any questions for Malagi? No, Councillor Mellon, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, it's just a few questions in relation to the application, or in relation to the, the reasons for refusal. I know Liam has went over a few of them, Maliki, um, but it was just in terms of Knowing the area, knowing the site, um, it is just within the outskirts of the Ballyarnod area. Um, that there does be, there has been that property lay vacant for quite some time. So, how can a uh, reason for refusal, refusal, knowing that it was lying um, empty, how is that taken away from any economic or industrial development? Whenever if this application fails today, it's going to lie vacant. So. Uh, there is all our business parks and industrial parks all around the town. I know the applicant has mentioned one on Trench Road, for example. Um, there has been all our recreation or activity outlets going in the Springtime Business Park, um, Pennyburn Industrial Estate. How is this different um, in terms of them as well? And um, has there been given all our considerations? I know they have mentioned around Spencer Road. Has consideration been given to existing businesses not too far away from Spencer Road that carries out these same activities as well? Thank you. Thank you. Maggie. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes. Um, I suppose uh, in terms of differentiation this application um, from examples elsewhere, um, I can begin with that first, is that this is on zone land. The area of plan um, identified I think, seven zonings. Um, a lot of the areas that you would traditionally consider as industrial land sort of predate the dairy area plan. So you would have the Burn, Springtown, Trench Road, etc. Wouldn't be zoned industrial land in the area plan, so um, it would be one key difference, I suppose, in this uh, in this instance. Uh, in terms of vacancy, Paul um, doesn't differentiate between whether it's vacant or occupied. Um, although I do take the point from the agent, but what it does ask us to take into account is whether it's zoned. Um, for instance, there could be land where there's no building on at all. 
through no application, but the policy asks us to protect that and they retain that uh, and uh, in that instance, so that, that that's how we would differentiate from that point. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. Aileen, do you want to come back to that? Yeah, uh, and I understand the part of the area plan that maybe some things aren't named certain words, but if you drive up the Springtown Road, you'll see it says Springtown Industrial Estate. Um, there's sometimes the need, the growing need um, can look at when we want to see within our areas, we want to see growth, we want to see uh, recreational outlets for young people, we want to see businesses thriving. And if we're going to favour an empty unit in place of a, an economic driver, all because of the, the policy that sits with it and there's no leeway in it, um, I think that's something that needs to be reconsidered here today. Although we might not see it on a dairy area plan um, very much within the mapping of this city, there is industrial estates with these kind of uh, activities taking place and the lack of consistency that this could show um, the, the precedents are already there for these kind of activities and the outskirts of areas. The actual access and the parking is a more benefit um, from being within these areas. And Chair, I'm not sure if there's other people wanting in, but I would like to make a recommendation. We want to take our speakers first. Okay, thank you, Ellen. I'm Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Chair, for letting us in. Uh, just, just maybe a couple of questions as such uh, to Malky. Malky, do you think that this would have a uh, a negative footfall on on our commercial businesses in the area, in the sense of, um, could this have the potential to create uh, unwanted footfall within a commercial area that will have a negative impact? And would it also, would this also risk maybe having um, risk the possibility of of creating a theme park within within a, a commercial? Satan uh, by stealth, you know, that this could happen and someone else added on somewhere else and you find we have, we have a theme park within a, a commercial zone. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose you have to look at the, the, the intention of the, the zoning and the policy. Um, when I'm sure at the time of the dairy area plan when we zoned industrial land, it was to set aside land that was attractive you know, for a, a prospective economic uses to come in. Uh, and on top of that, we had a, a plan application, an outline plan application, which actually specified the type of uses, which is quite unusual. You know, is it they, they specified um, particular uses in the plan use class which would be acceptable at this location? Uh, and again, so the reason that we do is that um, I suppose if you're a particular type of use, you like to have compatible uses beside you and nearby, like no objections from an engineering company next door. It, they they don't, didn't, didn't consider this leisure use to be a compatible use on an industrial site. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I can't comp I think if you look at the other policy then in terms of the, the SPPS, um, the reasoning for having town centre direct versus the town centres or central areas is because usually they're the best locations in terms of sustainability, i.e. that most members of public will already have a a car or, or not have car that no you can you can get a, a bus or whatever up to them walk in. Most people can get the town centre and uh, it also it creates positive footfall. Uh, and uh, alternative uses with fun town centres also that no, so I mean th th that's the only way I can answer your question. Answer you are is by looking at the the reasoning for the the, poly the, the actual zonings in the first place. Thank you. In terms of um, the 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 Springtown and um, Penaver and Dulcis, that you know, I mean, we do recognise that those are existing. Is uh, and as a PED4, um, as I said, so there is an exception that you, when you look at the character of an, of an industrial zone, and if the character has changed uh, substantially, and there's a lot of uses you know, 
Massachusetts and I'd like to know that's taking the take point and that's probably why we do find more of these type of uses acceptable on occasions. Some of them have permission, some of them don't have permission. Some of them are there for uh, such a long time that they, they, they're exempt from planning control. And also if they don't do Pennyburn and Springtown Industrials and the Northern Road are former enterprise zones, which were brought in the 1980s and 90s, which basically negated the requirement for any sort of planning consideration. Thank you. Thanks, Moggy. Are you content, Councillor Gallagher? Yes. Thank you, Councillor McKinney. Uh, thank you for letting me in, Chair. Hello. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, right, okay. Now, I just want to, that, that, and just as really from Allegan, that's the way industrial state on the right hand side as you head out to Bacrana Road. Would that be correct? Just an auto do, Allegan. Yeah. Um, you see the two car showrooms there? Are they, well, how would they be classed? Because that is an industrial zone. And the two car showrooms and also a place where uh, one of the car businesses actually just um, offloads cars before they're sold. You know, I'm trying to sort of get my head around this, that, you know, you have an industrial uh, site there and you, they want to put this, this well, non-industrial uh, bit of piece of uh, employment in there, keep it going. And what's the difference between that and the car showrooms sitting there at the side of the road in the industrial estate and cars lying there basically waiting to be sold and, and registered? I'm um, just trying to see differentiate there, you know, between the two. We can just maybe help us out there, please. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Um, well, uh, PPD seven sets out that, as well as the you no, know, the recognised planning use classes like you know, we have, we call them B one general industrial, light industrial, and storage and distributions. That some sui generis uses, as we call them, uh, compatible sui generis uses may be allowed in such locations where the sort of uses that you could really locate anywhere else, you know. Um, so you'll often find that the car sales areas are located in such locations. Uh, and I suppose the only other thing that would differentiate this proposal from a car show, showroom in terms of the, the policy, the policy specifically sets out that um, retail or leisure uses would um, not be, be considered acceptable um compatible sui generis uses thank you chair thanks moggy you content concern mckinney uh yeah okay thank you okay um concert dobbins thank you chair um maliki um um sort of inclined to agree with everybody else the previous speakers and i can sort of see what way this is going but you were saying there was exceptional circumstances for that word that you use that sui generis whatever it is right um that yeah i am aware of that area very well and there is a lot of empty um um uh, buildings at the moment or, or lots or whatever you want to call them but in, in my way i'm looking at this this is for children it is ideal there's there would be plenty of car parking spaces safety of the children you know down there um being being able to do and i could complement the other um shop um warehouses that are down there i could complement that you know there could be a footfall coming from that um if parents are leaving kids down or whatever you know they're they're going to do a bit of shopping in the area they're not going to go anywhere else i am aware of springtown and pennyburn you know that have these sort of facilities for children because that is ideal an industrial zone uh, an industrial area where you can have a big warehouse that would especially for the extreme jump um I, I am unfortunately Maggie that I am sort of tempting and I know that Aileen was looking to make a proposal, but I think that these are um exceptional circumstances. So therefore, um 
that's that's the way I'm going on it, Malachi. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. I don't think there was any questions on that. Um, so, Councillor Mellon. Thank you, Chair. Um, if there is no other speakers, Chair, I would like to make a proposal um, not to accept officer's recommendation and propose to approve that the planning application. I do think based on the alternative um, decision to leave a site lying empty um, wouldn't sit well with me within um, that area. There is a lot of other opportunities for anybody wanting under that site and this isn't taken away from anybody's economic or industrial opportunity within that site. And whilst I would love to see all um, businesses going towards the city centre and have it more thriving and encourage football for other businesses, that is not um, a way of practice within the city uh, and district as it stands today. There isn't these gymnasiums and activity spaces within the town centre. I hope that they will be added to in times ahead, but I wouldn't take this application away because that isn't something that's happening at the minute. I think as a, a council and as a district, we should be providing space um, for children and young people, regardless of where they are, and if they're not deemed to be appropriate within the city centre, then they can be taken away from them. And that's my reason today for um, proposing to accept the application or approve. Thank you, Councillor Mellon. I just see that Councillor McKinney has seconded your proposal from his remote location. Um, is there any other comments, members? Councillor Boyd? Yeah, uh, can you hear me okay, Chair? Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Chair, um, look, I, I tend to agree with Councillor uh, Millen on this. Uh, however, I'm not entirely sure I heard um, a planning reason for overturning the decision, Chair. Um, however, I would suggest that we can overturn that decision um, based on uh, the fact that this would be the provision of an, uh, an important amenity uh, for uh, increased health well-being, particularly of young people uh, in this particular area of the city, um, which is significantly uh, under provided for uh, with these sorts of opportunities. So I'm on the basis of amenity alone, Chair, I think there would be a strength of an argument um, to uh, reconsider this um, uh, and to overturn the recommendation to refuse. I appreciate all of the work that um, but you know, other officers, of course, have put in here. Um, uh, but uh, the weight of the argument for me falls down uh, in that particular direction. And I, I suppose in in relation, to, I suppose with John, your comments is is more supportive of Councillor Mellon's proposal. And my reading of the the planning reasons was in relation to the dairy area plan and that it wasn't um, a loss of industrial use because of the the fact that that site hadn't been um, utilised. But I'm going to uh, uh, allow Councillor Mellon to come back in and maybe Chair, provide a bit of clarity. Just to make sure, right, Chair, for coming back, cutting back in there, just to say, um, you know, that's an additional reason, in my view, um, yeah. for, for overturning the decision. Councillor Mellon, do you want to come on and, and provide any further clarity, or are you content? Um, for my um, reasons was the, um, the FPPS, the 6.280 and 6.281, um, and I suppose rather than noting them, I was given my reason and my perception of how it doesn't match with the officer's recommendation. So, yeah. And, and added to that is the, the amenity um, you said, Councillor Boyle, the other day. Councillor Harkin? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Chair. So th this is really just saying again what I think all our councillors have said. Look, I, I think we're being put in a uh, difficult situation here today because Maliki presented, a, in many ways, a Loctite argument. Uh, about why there should be 
ban and refusal for this, but then but then I just think that we have a situation where there it's contradicted all over the district area with all our examples of uh, where where we have allowed this to go forward or certainly haven't stopped it. So we certainly give the impression to people that what that what this proposal is doing is possible and probably uh, encouraged. Um, so I, I I do feel a bit of frustration about uh, the you know. Uh, all the arguments you laid out are very good. They're all in line with the policy. But then we have, let's say, uh, along the way, uh, and all our examples have been cited here that actually would create confusion for anybody engaged in such an enterprise. Thank you, Councillor Hargan. Members, um, I'm getting a sense that the proposal which has been seconded is unanimous. I haven't heard anybody speak. Alward and Councillor Gallagher has indicated that he's abstained. Um, everybody that has indicated or has spoke in relation to this application is speaking in favour of it. Um, so we've got abstentions from Councillor Harkin and from Councillor Gallagher. Is everybody else content they support the application or the proposal? If there's no descendant voices, yeah, um, I'm going to move on that that application is approved um, with the two abstentions noted from Councillor Harkin and from Councillor Gallagher. So that application has been approved. Um, members, I want to, at this stage, bring in the head of planning. Um, she has raised an issue, or an, an issue has been raised with her from a member of the committee. So I just want to bring, um, before we move on to the next application, I want to bring Moran um, to, to raise it with these. Thank you, Chair. Members, I just want to bring to your attention that something has been brought to my attention um, just at the start of the meeting that. Um, a member of the committee wasn't able to access policy documents that normally would be accessible in a certain way. And we've just sent around a link and an email should any members feel that they need to, to look at that um, for a prompt or an update. Um, I just want to make sure that that's available to yourselves um, when you're considering um, the applications today. For ease. So Lois has sent that round in terms of access. So hopefully that will assist as best as we can today. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Maura. Um, members, the next application is item number four in your pack. Members, I'm going to refer to the information that Maura brought their attention at the start of the meeting. So I'm going to, uh, they sent that information was circulated this morning. So a trust members um, have had that chance to, to cast their eyes over it, but I'm going to take a moment or two now just to familiarize yourselves with the late information that was circulated and we'll, we'll reconvene in a minute or so.
Members, are you content to proceed? Um, if there's anybody needs a bit of more time, can you speak up now? Okay. Chair, Members, uh, Chair, sorry. Yeah. Chair, although I, I now realise that this was sent this morning, I don't have access to my emails um, during working hours, and therefore, could I have another few minutes? Okay, okay. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Councillor Dobbins, are you content to proceed? I sent you a message, thank you. Yeah, no bother, thanks. Sounds like, um, members, our next application is item number four, LA 11 2020 0295. Um, it's an outline application for a dwelling and a garage and a farm southwest of. 18 Langford Road in Straban, and it's John that's going to take us through the application. Thank you, Chair. Can everybody see? Can you see the presentation? No, John. I'm no. Not, not picking up the presentation at all. Okay. Can I request we? Have somebody from AT? Yeah. So John, can I ask you to close your presentation and AT will share the presentation for you? John, John, can you hear me? Um, we're going to need you to stop sharing the screen and IT will share it for you. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. 
I think I'm going to get back to the meeting so I can stop sharing. John. Is that is that you sharing the, the screen or is it IT? It might be me. It yep. can't let me it won't let me do anything at the moment. The screen's frozen. Oh okay. Members, members, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to item number five and we'll come back the um the, the uh, appendix four. So appendix five is LA 11 2020 0345. It's an outline application for um, a two story detached dwelling and garage at Lands North of 12 Tolanee Road in Eglinton. And it's Suzanne that's going to take us through that one. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Suzanne. Can, is that, can everyone see that okay? Yeah, I, I can see it. It's it's no, that's much better. That's much better. Okay. Go ahead, Suzanne. Thank you, Chair. Um, item number five is the. I just put my mic up closer. Is an infill site for two-story detached dwelling and garage. LA eleven twenty twenty oh three four five, at uh, seventy meters north of twelve Tonley Road, Eglinton. This slide shows the location map submitted with the planning application and an overhead, um, a satellite overhead of the site, um, so for you, so you can pick up the the imagery around it. This is the red line, um, and again, this is the site in the context of the surrounding um, area. So the site's the front corner of a large agricultural field. Um, the policy context is listed in the slide screen at the moment um, and the main issue here um, constable returned um, with no objections the main issue here is is the uh, uh, the fact that officers feel that this site does not um, comply with CTY8 um, and the proposal has been submitted as an infill proposal so in terms of assessing CTY8 um, I'll just go back to the here. Looking at the fact that this site is um, part of a, part of a larger gap, this is the gap here, okay, um, of of existing land at the minute. And in terms of um, CTYA, it is quite clear that um, it allows the infilling of small gaps, um, but not parts of gaps, parts of larger gaps. Um, and uh, and looking at this site as well, um, it's quite clear that um, you know the keeping this gap as it is um, will help aid the um, rural character um, and um, within the area. So as I said, it's it's, it's a colour of a larger field. It's not considered a small gap. There's a recently constructed shed um, to the the southwest and an agricultural pens just immediately to the northeast boundary, um, and that's the reason in terms of CTY8, and that ultimately that this site represents a visual break when viewed amongst the existing development in the area. In terms of CTY13, officers do feel that the site does integrate. Um, there's no adverse impact on the amenity from noise, any, there's no issue in terms of disturbance. There is an existing shed beside it uh, within 75 metres and environmental health have flagged up that um, there may be issues in terms of amenity, but that is in the ownership um, of the applicant. Um, so really in concluding the details, um, you know, in terms of PPS 21, it really is down to whether this is interpreted as a gap site or not. Um, officers feel it doesn't constitute an infill opportunity and it would actually create ribbon development, uh, resulting in a suburban style build up of development when viewed with existing buildings further eroding the rural character of the area. 
So that is the recommendation to refuse, and I'll just put up refuse here. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Suzanne. Um, can I invite Jared, Jared McPeak, the agent, to address the committee? You're very welcome, yes, Jared. Yeah. Jared, can I ask you to put on your video? Hopefully and then you get five there. minutes. Yeah, thank you. You have five minutes to make your comments. Okay. Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, for the Planning Committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. With regards to the above application as stated by the Planning Officer, this application is for an unfilled site on the Tolanee Road. The definition of an unfilled site within PPS 21 has a gap site and a substantial built up frontage. For the purpose of this policy, the definition of a substantial built-up frontage includes a line of three or more buildings along the frontage without the accompanying development to the rear. Uh, the gap site is created with the built-up frontage uh, along the Tolony Road at this section of eight buildings consisting of dwelling houses and farm buildings, um, five to the north of this site and an additional two to the south of the site. And the average plot size um, along the Tony Road in this section is 40 metres on average, and our site is about 35 metre frontage. Uh, so it's very comparable to uh, all the other, all the other buildings along this uh, part of the site, part of the road. Uh, the Tony Road is a dead end road, which is the public road just stops outside the boundary of the site, and there's one dwelling just past the site and the little or very little passing traffic on that roadway at that point. Uh, within the, the site is elevated above Eggington Village. The proposed site cannot be viewed from any of the critical viewpoints from Woodvale, Valley Garden Road or the A2 as the landform uh, at the top of the hill falls back again to Tullinay Road. And as Suzanne said, that the site has got good integration uh, with heavy screening along the western boundaries and the eastern boundaries. Um, uh, further to that, on the east side of the Tolony Road, the landform rises up upwards again, so any proposed dwelling will be absorbed into the countryside. Uh, this application is for an unfilled, there was unfilled sites recently approved within Danish Japan Council. At the last planning committee I was at in 2019, application on Tamnairn Road for an unfilled site had two built up two houses and the unfill site was deemed to be acceptable and was approved by the planning committee. I would feel that this application has a fur further substantial built up frontage and can be included with them as being an unfill site. And I hope to see that the council can approve this application today. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Um, See, there's a question from Alderman McClintock. Go ahead, Heather. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Jared, for that presentation. Just, I have a wee question. I noticed that you read this on your notes that you sent through to us earlier. Um, I wonder if you can explain a wee bit more to us about this dead end road. I think it actually would be helpful if the officers were able to put up the overhead actually um, with the aerial view. And if you could talk us through, Jared, just exactly where the road went. I'm not familiar with this. Part, but if it would be helpful if that was on the screen and we could talk us just through where the traffic is and where the dead end part of it is. Okay, just before Jared, just before you come in, to, we can be waiting until Suzanne can get us. That's perfect. Is that us? Yes. Go on ahead. Yeah, so you can probably see the, the last slide actually might be better. Uh, the concept stupid one that's got a large scale that's uh, probably more detailed if we can put that one up Suzanne. Yes, that one there. Oh. So on that concept statement. Um, the, the road actually just stops approximately where you see the sundial at of the south side. 
after the road actually ends. Thanks for that, Jared. So the tra there is no traffic coming on down past us. Is it like a cul-de-sac or a, a just... No, it's a, it's a dead end road. And that existing house there, I think, is actually uh, no one living at the moment either. The last one in the, in the row. That's great. Thank you. Any further questions to Mr. McPeak? Can I can I come on? Apologies, I didn't uh, I didn't just get the thing typed at the box in time. Well, go on ahead, Mr. Uh, McCarrigan. Uh, th thank you, uh, yeah, Mr. McPeak. Here you see in relation to this here, um, the uh, th this is classified then. Uh, is this this is going to be a farm dwelling? Is that uh, the the gist of it here? And this field that this has been placed in there as um, as designated then as as a, as a your class find here is a gap site here and we're working with an existing agricultural shade there which you see from the the pictures then that's a, a fresh looking shade there that's been built there on this lower side of the site and uh, can you confirm then that the adjoining field there on the upper side of the site there uh i see there it's a wee bit difficult to say is there a set of pens on there uh on that site and is that going to the same farmer or is that the on there, it's just I would be minded of uh, well, I'll let you respond. To it, but can, if the man has a set of pens there, you, you know, I see where officers are coming with in relation to the size of the site, but that has a right of way up. That there has a, is there a house or something in the next field up up from the, this site, and therefore that strip of ground which is on the far side of the of the boundary fence there is really a bigger field, and the try to on site would be really leaving that ground to the back of that side as landlocked. Would that kind of be a fair assumption? Yeah, well, the, the owner of the land um, has, has a shed there, yes, indeed, and this would be his principal farm residence. Um, it's an uh, established farm at the minute. That's what he's, uh, his love for is farming, and um, he currently has a few animals there that he he wants to elaborate on and, and grow over the over the future, but at the minute, this will be the place where he would like to have his dwelling house on the farm, and um, it's a fairly recent farm enterprise as well, but yes, this will be the main farm residence. Just as a wee follow-up there, if, you, if you'll indulge me, as the field on the upper side of this dwelling site, is that ground in his ownership, or maybe it's not in his ownership? Um, I'm not just totally okay. I, I'm not sure it, it is. It, it may be actually, but I'm not sure which one of those is. I've actually detailed what I thought at the time what the outline was of the land, but um, it, it may also be that section in there as well. But the farm pens are. Yeah, that, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Alderman Kerrigan. Um, thanks, Jared. Is there any further questions for Mr. McPeak? No, before I move on to the questions to officer. No, thank you, Jared. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Uh, uh, questions for Suzanne? Alderman McClintock? for that it's maybe not as much a question but to maybe really a comment at the moment i suppose I, i'm failing to see how this uh how this development would be inappropriate um i think it does support the rural community and i suppose i, I feel it does it really does meet the existing developmental pattern and i feel to, to be able to agree that the proposal will result in a suburban style build-up and um, first further as well, I don't really agree that it would further erode the rural character of the the area. But if I, for a question really to Suzanne, I suppose I would ask the fact that this is a dead end road, does that have any weight in the decision? Because it really, to me, it doesn't really appear like a ribbon development. Okay. Thanks, Jim. I'm trying to I'll come in there, Chair, if that's okay. Um, the, the policy, Councillor McClintock, asks us to look at um, these sites from, from all vantage points. So the fact that it's a dead end road wouldn't carry much weight. 
Um, I appreciate your, cons you know, the points you're making there in terms of, you know, um, the other buildings and stuff. But I suppose the issue is, you know, you have um, agricultural shed here. You have another shed up here. You know, the area is rural in, in character. And the whole point of CTY8 is to look at areas whereby the character is, is possibly already gone um, and where the infilling of a small gap will not increase or increase the building suburbanization if you want to call it that so our, our consideration was look um this is part of a larger gap now on the plans that were submitted with the planning application um and i'll just go back and, and go over the the red line and the blue the blue land so that's what's submitted with the application so you know we on the basis of what was submitted we're we're of the view that this other land is not owned by the applicant um and um I'm not sure who operates the cattle pen, which is in that corner there. So just to clarify that issue, because I know Jared had, had maybe um, discovered, you know, had obviously mentioned that earlier. But in, in TY8, we're, we're looking at infilling a small gap whereby the area is eroded, um, and, and this will make no difference. And clearly, this is only, this site's only part of a much larger gap whereby the area. Oh, yes, there are buildings on up, but I mean, um, this gap provides a visual break in that. Content, Alderman McClintock? Yes. Thank you. Councillor McGuire? Chair, uh, thank you, Chair. I think we're back down to interpretation. Um, to me, you know, some farm dwellings, some farms, uh, the rural character, if we're talking about the rural character, if you drive along somewhere, some of the farms are along the roadside. They're linear. Some of them go back, and you know, go deeper onto the the field. So you know, it's not, you know, there's no uh, set standard for a farm or for the rural character. So that's that's kind of what I mean by we're uh, we're down to interpretation. So to me, um, this this doesn't uh, uh, CTY4, it doesn't uh, result in a suburban style build up. It's not going that far back into the field. It has uh, mature trees in the backdrop and it has a, a mature hedge along the front. Uh, it has a, a massive agricultural shed at the side and pens at the front. So, you know, in some type of suburban build up, you're not going to get that. Uh, adds to urban development, you know, it is an unfull site, you know, the there's development on both sides of it, so I can't see how it would add to urban development. And for that reason, Chair, I would propose we don't accept the officer's recommendation and we go for approval. Thank you, um, Councillor McGuire. I don't think there was a question contained within that. Um, is there any further comments, members? Any further questions? If I can take a liberty here and, and come on, I do apologise for. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I would concur with remarks by by Councillor McGuire there. I, I have looked here and actually got a well, what I would classify as a better um, aerial picture of that location and the the full uh, Tullany Road as you come in, and uh, I I would be very much minded it would. Uh, slot in to the rural character and, and that location for a larger aerial shot, that that portion of road seems to be very much a dwelling house, farm buildings, there's a wee gap, there's a dwelling house, there's farm buildings. It, 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 it seems like it would shoot very much into that area in particular where it would be placed. And as I say, I would I would contest in relation to that uh, the, uh, the, the, the suburban character. I mean, you have a set of pens to, to the to one side of this dwelling house, and as, as uh, uh, Councillor McGuire stated, you have a large agricultural shade to the other. I think it would very much uh, fit in, and plus that 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 gap going up onto there, that I still maintain when you're looking at it from a from a different uh, from a larger aerial photograph, that that strip of ground where the pens are is effectively entering up into a large agricultural field, and so there you still need access into that field. So to 
put the house over the full site, you'd be leaving no access in. So I would be minded to second Councillor Maguire's uh, proposal to, to not accept the officer's recommendation on this occasion. Thank you very much for letting me in, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Kerrigan. Any further questions or comments, members? Members, we've got a proposal from Councillor Maguire, um, seconded by Alderman Kerrigan. They approve the application in front of us. Members, I'm going to need to ask um, would, in relation to conditions, um, if you're making an approval, um, is it something to draft? conditions or is there any specific con conditions that you would wish to attach to the approval standard conditions chair okay um i just note that councillor gallagher has indicated that he wishes to abstain uh, along with councillor hargan and councillor boyd members just um is there any as as can I take it that everybody else is in support of this application? Is there any is there any dissent in that see given there's quite a few um, people that have abstained, so I'm going to have to ask um, the head of planning to take a, a recorded vote on this one. So members, there's a proposal from Councillor Maguire, the seconded by Alderman Kerrigan, they approve subject to draft conditions. Or standard conditions. Um, cons or Mara? Thank you, Chair. Members, in terms of recorded vote, this is for item five. Um, and the recommendation is to overturn the office recommendation to refuse. Councillor Jason Barr? For. Councillor John Boyd? I'm afraid I'm going to have to abstain based on the basis more that I lost this connection there for a significant part of the um, presentation. Okay, no problem. Alderman Alan Breslin. Aye. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Have to abstain too, Maura. No problem. Got that. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Dean. Councillor Sean Harkin. Abstain. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Four. Councillor Dan Kelly. Four. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Four. Keith. Alderman Helen McClintock. Four. Councillor Kim McGuire. Four more. Okay. Councillor Philip McKinney. Four. Thank you. Councillor Aileen Mellon. Four. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Stain. Thank you. That's everything, Chair. So that's. So that's nine four and five abstentions. So that vote carries. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Um, so members, that application has been approved. Um, going to move back now and see if we can get John. Um, John, are you on the line? Yep, I'm here. Okay, John, I'm going to go straight to Plan B. I'm going to ask um, IT to share the presentation for item appendix four. Yep. Going ahead, take two. Over to you, John. Thank you, Chair. So this is appendix four. If we could go back to the first slide, sorry. Uh, which is LA 11, 2020. 02950 and its erection of a farm dwelling approximately 120 metres southwest of 18 Lakeford Road, Straban. And uh, the recommendation is to refuse. 
Next slide, please, which um, shows a site location plan. And you can see the red line there highlighted as the application site. Okay, next slide, thank you. Is the uh, planning policy consideration. Uh, the site you will see is located in the rural countryside as sat down in the Straban area plan and it's located along the Lakeford Road. It's also located within the area of outstanding natural beauty, the Sperrins AONB. And this sets out the policies that the application has been assessed in line with. They're set out there. There's the SPPS, PPS2, which deals with natural heritage, PPS3, which concerns access, movement, and parking. And of course, PPS 21, Sustainable Development in the Countryside, and its four policies in particular, which is CTY 1, CTY 10, uh, to do with farm dwellings, uh, CTY 13 and 14, which are to do with integration and design of buildings in the countryside, and rural character, respectively. So it's familiar territory uh, for the committee. Next, please, is uh, an assessment of policy. So uh, farm dwellings assessed under CTY10 must meet all three of the following criteria. The first one is that the farm business must be currently active and established for six years. Uh, there's no problem in that regard in the current case. And no dwellings or development opportunities must be sold off from the farm holding within the 10 years previous to the date of the application. And again, there's no problem in that regard. The um, part of the policy that there is a problem with is this part, which is part C. The new building must be visually linked or cited to cluster with an established group of buildings on the farm where practical access should be from an existing laneway. So next slide, please. Um, this is more assessment of the policy, particularly um, setting out that, um, except that the farm is active and established and has been for more than six years. The applicant is a nephew of the active farmer who resides at number 14 Lakeford Road. Uh, the applicant lives with his mother and father at number 18, which lies to the north of the site. The farm comprises 25 hectares in around uh, number 14 Lakeford Road. And the site in in our view, is not linked or clustered with the buildings on the farm. So if we can have the next slide, please, you will see um, an aerial view of the site. And you can see here towards the northeastern portion of the aerial photograph there, that is the active farm. And you will see uh, the red line to the southwest of the aerial view there. That is the application site, so it is some distance away. In fact, it's 240 metres uh, from the application site. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so CTY10 requires that a dwelling on an active farm is either visually linked or clustered with buildings on the farm. Uh, the authority does not consider that this site either clusters or visually links with the buildings on the farm, partly due to the distance and also because of the local topography, uh, which is quite undulating. So to approve a dwelling on this site would be contrary to Part C of Policy CTY 10 of PPS 21. This slide is uh, a site photo view of the application site from the Lickford Road. Uh, you can see that some buns, uh, raised banks have been created there around the perimeter of the site. 
already. If we could have the next slide, please. That's another view of the site with um, the Earthbund, which also has uh, had some uh, placed on top. And then uh, slide concerns integration and rural character, uh, which are covered by policies CTY 13 and 14 of and they talk about the impact of the development on integration into the surrounding countryside and the rural character of the area. Um, we consider that the site lacks long established natural boundaries and a dwelling on this site would not satisfactorily integrate into the countryside. Um, it's our consideration that the bund that has been created, if anything, draws the eye more to what appears to be an incongruous man-made feature in this rural area. In terms of assessing the impact on rural um, character, uh, we think the development would be unduly prominent and the new domestic access onto Lickford Road would have a detrimental impact on the rural area, resulting in an unacceptable form of suburban development. Next slide, please. So members will be aware that some late items uh, have been submitted. So there was uh, an email and also a supporting statement submitted uh, from uh, the agent, who I think will be speaking later, and also uh, a letter of support from Michaela Boyle. So I've added some slides here to um, deal with some of the points that were raised in those late items. Uh, the agent considers the case officer's report to be misleading and that it doesn't refer in detail to the other sites referred to by the agent on the farm holding. So these slides are to address uh, these points. Paragraph 8 of the statement refers to some particular fields on the farm maps, which immediately abut the established group of buildings on the farm. Um, these are fields 2, 3, 4, 5 and 10. And the statement considers that a dwelling on fields 2, 4 or 5 would be indivisible with four other dwellings and would impact on the rural character of the area. It goes on to say that the group of farm buildings are elevated above the road and are highly visible. If we can go to the next slide, it shows a photo of this grouping here. So the uh, farm grouping and number 14 Ligford Road, that is the active farm, if you like. Uh, to the right of the screen there is uh, number 18 Lakeford Road. And on the next slide, this shows you the farm maps. And we have annotated this just to make it a little bit clearer for you. So um, the farm grouping at number 14 Lakeford Road is in the centre of the image there. And you can see some of the fields um, that the agent will refer to in her statement and that I will refer to uh, in the next few slides. So you have fields two and three to the north of the main farm grouping and fields four and seven uh, to the west. You have number 18 Ligford Road, which I believe is the uh, applicant's property at the moment. And you'll see the application site, uh, which is some way uh, to the southwest. So if we take the next slide, please. This is uh, a consideration of the specific points raised in the late item. So the statement from the agent states that access to fields two is via a steep concrete lane and access to field 10 is also restricted by existing farm buildings and a yard with a silage pit. Now that is the access to the farm itself, but just to make it clear for members, the farm has two access points uh, between two and four, uh, fields two and four, and between fields two and three. 
Now, the one between fields two and four is a domestic access, which leads to some other dwellings already. So that's number 14, number 14A, and a new dwelling that has been constructed. Uh, so officers accept that field 10 is too close to the working farmyard. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Then this shows field seven, which is directly in front of number 18 Bickford Road, uh, a dwelling on that open field directly in front of the road junction would not integrate and would also have a detrimental impact on rural character. Um, field five is to the rear of that dwelling on higher ground, so we accept they probably aren't the best sites. We we'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, field four is directly in front of number 14. Um, at a lower level than the farm buildings. I don't think that's up on the screen yet. Can we move to the next slide there? I believe there's a problem with the network. There we go. There we go. Okay, and then moving on to field two, uh, which is at a lower level than the farm buildings and slopes gently down to the Ligford Road. Part of this field is to the front of the new dwelling that has been constructed. The rest of the field abuts and is immediately north of the farm grouping. Which is a final summary. So the case officer's report and our consideration focused mainly on the application site, uh, which is what we would normally do. Having fully assessed the application site, which is located approximately 120 metres southwest of number 18 Lakeford Road, it is still considered the chosen site does not cluster or visually link with the group of buildings on the farm. The authority's opinion that a dwelling elsewhere, closer to the farm, for example, on fields two, three, or four, would meet policy CTY 10, 13, and 14 of PPS 21. So, having considered all material considerations, including the relevant planning policies, it is considered that the application proposal fails to meet the above mentioned policies, and as such, we have recommended refusal of this farm dwelling in the rural area. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. Um, can I invite Una Gavin um, to address the committee? Una is, is Una on the line. Sorry, Chair, let me just check with her. I know Una is ringing in by oh. telephone. She can't. Oh, there she is. Hold on, Hello, okay, and are you there? Yes, I'm there. Good to go. I know you're very welcome. I know you've got five minutes to um, address the committee. Go okay. ahead. Um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The application is presented as a dwelling on a farm. It has been agreed by the planning department that the farm is active and has been established for at least six years, and no dwellings or development opportunities have been sold off in the last 10 years. So the farm in question meets the first two criteria for dwelling on a farm and so in principle qualifies for dwelling under CTY 10. It is also the case the applicant is an active worker on the farm. The principal issue for the planning department is that the site is not physically linked or cluster with an established group of buildings on the farm. Whilst there is a group of buildings on the farm some 220 metres from the site, I consider that it would not, would not be possible to create, locate a dwelling to cluster with this group in a way that would be, would be compatible with planning policy. In circumstances in which a policy or proposal is considered under policy CTY 10, the policy also expects that the proposed site meets the requirements of policy CTY 13, which is concerned with integration, and CTY 14, which is concerned with rural character. Existing buildings on the farm are on an elevated site 
and comprise a number of agricultural buildings and two two-storey dwellings. There's also two bungalows nearby. The farm group and the four dwellings that I just referred to occupy a prominent position overlooking the Big Class Lickford Road and the Minor Road, and they're all highly visible from those roads. I have looked at the options for setting a dwelling in such a way that it would cluster or would be linked with the established group of buildings, and in each case, one or more problems would arise. The issues that I found are as follows. In some cases, there's going to be a suburban style build up where the house is intervisible with the four existing houses. In other cases, there will be loss of residential amenities, both existing and proposed dwelling. Uh, some phase, there's going to be a lack of integration given prominence and lack of screening. In other cases, there's restricted access because of existing farm buildings and a yard with a savage pit, and uh, I think uh, the planner agreed with that. And then there's some of the fields are accessed by a steep concrete lane, which would not be suitable for everyday domestic use. And there's no other buildings on the farm. It would appear that criterion C of CTY 10 therefore cannot be met. But in my view, that does not mean that planning permission ought to be refused. Policy CTY 10 simply confirms that planning permission will be granted where all of the criteria can be met, but it makes no requirement that criterion A to C are met as a precursor to the grant of planning permission. So there's some flexibility. Given the restrictions to siting a dwelling beside the farm group, I would ask the members to consider the prospect of granting planning permission on an alternative site. The applicant has chosen a site that is low lying and bounded on three sides of vegetation. The dwelling will be set back from the road. The site sits below the road by about one metre. A bund planted with trees about five metres in height bounds at three sides, thereby providing a sense of enclosure. In some views, existing trees provide screening for a dwelling, and in other views, they provide a backdrop. It is, it is considered that the site is capable of accommodating a dwelling of low elevation. The applicant approached his bank about acquiring a mortgage to build a house on the site, and he was told that he, he would not get a mortgage if the house shared the existing access. So access onto the existing lane has been considered, but is not practicable. All things considered, it is considered that the siting of the proposed dwelling is acceptable, and that planning permission may be granted under policy CTY 10. Um, I did uh, present a late item, and I do appreciate the fact that that has been considered and um, that uh, Mr. Spottiswood has went through the alternative sites that I had passed comment on in my statement. So I appreciate that that's been taken on board in his presentation. Uh, that completes what I have to say. Uh, thanks very much for your time and for calling it in, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Una. Members, any questions for Una? No. I'm going to move on now. If nobody indicates, I'm going to move on to questions, staff, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, questions to John? Members, any questions at all? They Here. Any comments at all? Councillor Kelly? Thanks, Chair. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Councillor Kelly? Thanks, Chair. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I'm going to keep talking anyway. Um, I do have a question for the officer in terms of the uh, the element of uh, CTY10, which regards the visual uh, linkage. And we've had this query and um, a number of times before the committee. And I think the most recent one was the uh, Commons application uh, on the on the Dairy Road, which uh, was uh, I'm not sure if it was in the green belt, but it was just bordering the green belt of the old Straban area plan. Uh, and that one, uh, there was a significant uh, difference uh, um, distance between the application site and the farm cluster. And I think that was similar to the one 
um, that we had previously dealt with in Ahi Arn. And, and, and those, uh, we had the benefit of site visits. And I do think uh, perhaps a site visit would have been really useful in this case to see that the officer refers to the short um, localized views of the site. Uh, so there's no long distance views of the site. So from all of those short distance uh, localized views, uh, is it not the case that you can see the site and the farm cluster uh, at one and the same time, uh, that they are uh, visually linked in that sense, because wherever you're looking from, uh, either of those surrounding roads, uh, the Lake Road or the Cavanagh Lee Road, or uh, um, that they, they, you can't actually see uh, the application site without, without also seeing uh, the farm cluster, um, and the sheds and the farmhouse at one and the same time. Answer that. Um, okay, well, I think from certain viewpoints, more than both, um, but because of uh, the undulating nature of the land in that area uh, from the site, um, I, I do not consider uh, that it would uh, visually link, and um, due to the distance, uh, it certainly doesn't cluster. Councillor Kelly, do you want to come back on? I, think, I don't think anyone's making the case for the fact that it's clustering. It clearly doesn't cluster, but in terms of the visual uh, link, I think we have made this case at the committee before uh, and we have approved on that basis before because the, the, the policy doesn't actually make uh, or stipulate uh, a minimum distance between uh, the application site and the, um, the, the farm cluster. Uh, and also it doesn't make any reference to sort of undulating uh, topography. And I think we've argued that in the uh, the Commons application previously. So I think, you know, we seem to kind of always kind of have to go back to square one whenever we come to these applications, comment to committee. Um, and, you know, the, the, the applicant has uh, stated that there are issues around uh, financing a site closer to the um, farm cluster that's currently there in terms of trying to get a mortgage, which would uh, entail using either of the two accesses and driving through the farmyard to get to the, the you know, some uh, potentially or speculative other site. Uh, my, my take on it is uh, this is uh, visually linked. Uh, I, I don't see how it can, you can argue the case that it's not. I do think it does meet part C uh, of CTY 10. Uh, in the in the same way that has been argued before and accepted by the committee before, uh, and we have um, as a precedent uh, as a committee established that we don't we haven't set a minimum distance between this visual linkage, um, uh, and I know planners have taken a different view on that, but um, that that is something that has been through uh, PAC, and I know we we we've. Um, there have we've, we've we've accepted that, and I, I think this is a similar, very similar case. Sorry, Chair, you're on mute. I just thank you, thanks, John, thanks, Dan, for that. Um, any further comments or questions? No. Chair, can I come in for a second just? Yeah. Sorry if we're not in the box there. Go on ahead, Councillor Minnie. Um, just referring back to the previous comments there, but I'm just looking at the agent's um, letter that was sent in today. Um, um, it really, the difficulty that I have looking at this is that the agent against her own application. In paragraph two, whilst there is, I've just cited here, if that's okay, whilst there is a group of buildings on the farm some 220 metres from the site, I consider that it would not be possible to locate a dwelling to cluster with this group in a way that would be compatible with planning policy. And number five, then a part of five, would be, it would appear that the criterion C of CTY10 can space not be met. Um, that sort of gives me raise the concern that, that, you know, even the agent is sort of who's applying on behalf of the applicant, um, is citing really that they can't make their own case out based on CT10, and uh, 
that sort of gives me some sort of apprehension about this application. So that's all I want to say at the moment there, Chair. Thank you. Um, we've moved beyond questions to the agent, and I suppose that would have been an ideal opportunity to ask the agent to, to provide an explanation, but uh, we're, we're beyond that now. Thank you. Um, any questions to John? Any comments, members? Members, we've, we've got a recommendation to refuse, and the refusal reasons have been set out. Sure, can I? Can, can I? Um, Councillor Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, it's just in terms of the area plan and, and viewing the application through uh, the lens of the area plan, which does allow for um, not a lowering of standards, but just um, a different interpretation of policy because of the context of the rural remainder uh, within the Sturban area. And I think it's important um, to uh, this is this is uh, an applicant that's clearly, um, you know, he's from the area. Uh, that's his uh, his family are living in houses nearby. Clearly, uh, and I'm not sure what the, the the future is, but it looks like uh, it's about going back to work on the farm. And I know, like the um, in terms of the AONB policy within the area plan, it does say at, at one two zero point three in terms of needing to give weight to the socioeconomic problems uh, in the rural remainder. Uh, and I think if you look, uh, there's issues there around depopulation, which are referenced in the area plan. Uh, and uh, the fact that the area plan in terms of CTY1 uh, does allow for uh, not needing to make a case for living in the countryside, not needing to make a case uh, in, the, in the rural remainder outside those uh, specified areas uh, in the AONB, such as Stroh Valley. So I think uh, if you look at things like the, the closure of the local school in Avish over uh, recent time, you can see the impact of, uh, um, you know, where there has been rural depopulation and people are moving away. And there's, um, so I think in terms of giving weight to the, the, you know, what it says in the plan around socioeconomic problems around uh, um, planning permission where applicants are not required to give a reason, although in this case it's pretty clear that they're going back to the family farm or looking to set up a future for themselves uh, on the family farm. Um, I just think that in the round, I think the, the visual linkage can be made. Um, uh, we have gone with that distance before. Um, so I, I I'm, I'm not. I'm not persuaded that there's a clear case that uh, the visual linkage can be made. I think it can be, and I think it would have benefited probably uh, from a site visit uh, for members who are not familiar with it. Um, I think, given the backdrop of uh, you know the impact on the landscape, you know you've got the forestry there behind it. You can see that in the photographs. What you can see in the photographs is the one that again. So uh, you know th this is not going to be. Um, a major impact in that localized area of the AONB because it's already impacted by the forestry and by the uh, by the two one farms that have been approved uh, and a third one on bulk which has also been approved. So um, for that uh, and for that reason, um, I, I don't accept the officer recommendation um, to refuse. Uh, I think because core to the, the to my understanding of just that local area is that uh that it is visually linked notwithstanding uh 240 meters you know it's not a very big distance uh, i think you can't see the site uh, or you can't view the site in isolation uh from the farm cluster from any of those very short localized views um and yeah for that reason i, I don't accept the officer's recommendation um So, Councillor Kelly, um, can I get clarity? Um, is that a proposal to approve the application? I would be happy to propose uh, that we don't accept and a uh, recommendation from the officer and we uh, approve this application. Okay. Um, is that seconded by Councillor McGuire? Okay. Thanks, Karen. Um, 
Dan, just just for clarity again, um, in terms of conditions, are you content that um, there would be draft conditions attached? Or standard conditions att attached? Yes, I'm, I'm content that there would be standard conditions attached and indeed if there's a need for a, a landscape, um, you know, all of that, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, members, I just note that Councillor McKinney has indicated that he's abstaining. Is there, is there anybody, is, it, is everybody else in, a, in, in support of the proposal? Okay, um, members, I'm going to have to take a recorded vote. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Maura in a second, but I'm going to, it, this is a proposal from Councillor Kelly. They approve application second by Councillor McGuire. Um, Maura. Thank you, Chair. So this relates to item four, recorded vote, not to accept um, the officer's recommendation. Councillor Jason Barber. Councillor John Boyle. Against. Alderman Alan Breslin. For. Councillor Angela Dobbins. For. Councillor Paul Gallagher. For. Councillor Sean Harkin. For. Councillor Christopher Jackson. For. Councillor Dan Kelly. Councillor Kelly. Or Mora. Thank you. Alderman or. Keith Kerrigan. Or. Thank you, Keith. Councillor Helen McClinton. Alderman Holderman McClinton, please. Or. Thanks, Hillary. Councillor Kieran McGuire. Sir Philip McKinney. Abstain, Maura. Stop that, yes, thanks, Philip. Councillor Aileen Mellon. Or Maura. Thank you, Aileen. Councillor Sean Mooney. Against, Maura. Sorry, could you repeat that? Against. Thank you, you got that. Okay. Okay, we have one abstention, 11 for and two against. So that vote carries. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Maura. So that application has been approved. Members, we've went beyond the two hour mark. So I'm going to suggest we take a 10 minute break. Um, it's almost ten past um, ten past four at the minute. We're going to reconvene at twenty past. So um, I'll see you all in just over ten minutes. Thanks, members.
Members, um, are we ready to reconvene? Can I just ask John, is he on the line? Yep, I'm ready, Chair. John, brilliant. Um, can I ask ET to share John's presentation? Members, our, our next application is Index Note 1. Um, it's LA 11 um, and it's John that's going to take us through this. Go on ahead, John. Thank you, Chair. So, yes, this is LA 11 and it is a proposed site for one detached dwelling and garage to the rear of 12 and 13 the beaches and also to the rear of 14 Ballyfatten Park, Cyan Mills. And the recommendation is to approve. So if we move to the next slide, um, you have an aerial view of uh, the site, um, which is really uh, an informal part of the garden to the rear of number four Primrose Park. Uh, so it's rough and partly overgrown ground, um, but it is in an existing built up area. Next slide, please. Um, so this is planning history for the site. Uh, it has a live outline planning approval for two dwellings on the same site, uh, but please uh, note uh, the access for this um, approved application would be through number four, Primrose Park. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, this is the current proposal. As you can see, there's a hedge between the two properties there and some landscaping. And the access instead uh, would come through uh, Bally Fatten Park. Um, which is, I was going to say to the east, I think that's actually the south. Uh, yes, that's the south. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. So um, one letter of support was received and 57 objections and also uh, a petition with 28 signatories. Uh, so there's a summary here of the objections. Um, intensification of traffic at a dangerous access. Objectors considered the access to be too narrow, compounded by on-street parking, not wide enough for emergency, amenity and construction vehicles. They felt that it would cause additional parking congestion, uh, loss of off-street parking for residents, some of whom have limited mobility, stress to residents, prohibit access to garages and restrict use of pavements, that there would be an impact on road safety and children playing, uh, that the new curb will cause difficulty accessing garages, turning and manoeuvring and further limit parking. The new pathway proposed would be used as a quick entrance to Primrose Park, impacting on privacy and the security of residents. They suggest the entrance should be via Primrose Park as the existing scheme, and they were concerned upon uh, privacy and loss of light to numbers 13 and 14 Ballyfatten Park. Noise and disturbance of construction traffic and residential traffic. They felt that approval would lead to further development of the site. They were worried about property values and they were worried that the development would disturb bats living in the area. And there were also some procedural objections uh, regarding neighbour notifications and the availability of plans online. We could go to the next one, please. So uh, this is policy and objections consideration. Uh, the application was originally submitted for four dwellings, but the proposal has since been reduced to one dwelling. Development can be provided on site in keeping with scale, density and pattern of surrounding housing and with sufficient level of private amenity space and in curtilage parking. Site layout demonstrates the dwelling can be provided on the site, retaining sufficient separation distance to the objector's rear gardens and rear windows and to neighbouring properties to omit any significant overlooking impacts 
loss of privacy or loss of light. Any noise generated from construction of the development would be for a temporary period only. And it is not considered that residential traffic associated with one dwelling would have a significantly greater impact than existing traffic noise levels experienced at neighbouring residential properties. Objectors raised concerns that the development would disturb a colony of bats, but there was no supporting evidence given that there is a colony in the area. Given the extent of vegetation on the site and an extant planning approval for two dwellings, a bat survey was not considered necessary. Next slide, please. So this uh, red dotted line just shows the proposed access to the site through Ballyfatten Park, uh, which has it is a cul-de-sac at the moment uh, and would remain so. Uh, and it has a dog leg uh, along the um, road there. Next, please. These are some views of the access point off Ballyfatten Park. And you will see there that the um, the image on the left, um, there are some existing garages and the vegetation at the end, that's where the application site is. And on the right there is another view of the garages. Next slide, please. And these are just some more images further along um, the access road and the road into the site and just showing existing on-street parking. Uh, some properties don't have in curtilage parking. Next, please. So Rhodes' advice was that the development would lead to an 8.3% intensification of traffic using the Ballyfatten Park access. Uh, the existing carriageway width of 4.9 metres and footway width of 1.9 metres is inadequate for this intensification. They're requiring a minimum 5.5 metre carriageway and 2 metre footway, which isn't possible within the confines of the road. Seven of the 11 houses have no in curtilage parking and park on the street. A 2 metre footway is required to provide a pedestrian connection between the development and the existing footway. However, a 6.8 metre width is required for turning and manoeuvring of vehicles in front of the garages. Next slide, please. So we've considered the advice from roads. Uh, Ballyfatten Park is a dead end road, not a through road, and doesn't have access, direct access onto a protected route. Road and footpath widening recommended by DFI roads is not possible within the confines of the park. Vehicular traffic associated with one dwelling would not be considered a significant increase. It's only 3.3% exceedance of the 5% intensification figure. Uh, vehicular movements associated with one dwelling would not significantly inconvenience traffic flow. A two metre footpath and 6.8 metre turning manoeuvring area in front of the garages is not possible within the confines of the road. Provision of the footpath would make access to the garages more difficult and restrict turning manoeuvring of vehicles at the end of this road. Pedestrian traffic associated with one dwelling would not be considered significant to merit the footpath provision particularly when it would adversely impact upon traffic flow. So you will have seen from the report, the um, applicant at one point um, submitted a plan, including um, a pavement in front of the garages, uh, but this has now been excluded. Because on balance, uh, we consider that a single dwelling can be provided on the site with access onto Ballyfatten Park without prejudicing road safety or pedestrian safety or significantly inconvenience the flow of traffic. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the recommendation is to approve uh, in accordance with the drawings shown here. So you will see from the drawing on the right, um, the end of the cul-de-sac would remain as it is now. 
there would be no uh, pavement obstructing the turning of vehicles in front of the garages. Um, and yes, the recommendation is to approve. I think that's the last slide. Could we just check, please? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's it. Thank you. Um, John, members, any questions for John? Any comments whatsoever, members? I'm there's a there's a recommendation to approve um, this application. And I'm also mindful that there's there, there's a previous planning history on this site, Councillor Boyle. Thank you, Chair. You hear me? Okay. Yep. Yep, look, Chair, I uh, just to thank John for the report and actually um, it's interesting that you referenced the, um, the previous planning history as well. Uh, I don't want to labour the point, Chair, I, I'm quite content with the report as it's been presented to us and, uh, uh, and on, uh, on the face of it, uh, it um, having taken into consideration all of the various objections and the answers to those particular objections, uh, Chair, I think um, I'd be content to uh, recommend that we uh, the officer recommendation on this occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Um, Councillor Okay. Um, Councillor McGuire. Yeah, Chair, I don't know if it's already been seconded, but uh, just to support it, but just to say that I think it was a must opportunity for not having the three dwellings in there, you know, because there's there's a very small turnover of houses and sign malls and, uh, you know, Another couple of houses uh, certainly would have been utilised very fast in my experience of saying mills. So just to support it and second it, if it's not already been seconded. Yeah, I think, I think Aldham and Aslan might have just gone in front of you, Councillor McGuire, but um, we've... Just remember that. I take, um, your, I take your pick. Okay. Um, any further comments, members, before we... Is there anybody um, that doesn't support the proposal from Councillor Boyle to accept the recommendation to approve? Yeah. If there's no dissent on voices, members, I'm going to take that as unanimous. Okay, that was unanimous, members, proposed by Councillor Boyle, seconded by Alderman Breslin. Um, so that has been approved. Our next application is Appendix 3 in our packs. It's LA 11, 2019, It's a full application. It's a council application for a proposed pontoon and upgrading of car park and the installation of an external platform at the Braham Boathouse in the Victoria Road in Derry. And it's Malky that's going to take us through that. Thank you, Chair. Just share this with you now. Uh, see that, yeah? Margie, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. This is item three, um, LA 11 2019 0716F. Um, the application is for proposed pontoon, an upgrading of existing car park and installation of an external platform cast at Prahan Boathouse, uh, Derry. And the recommendation is to approve. Um, the attached image shows the site location as so outlined in red and includes the the existing car park and access off of Victoria Road, um, the existing um, boathouse building, and the uh, existing uh, steps leading down to the River Foyle. And uh, the, the image on the right will be uh, an indication of the layout of the site and an aerial view. Um, and here's some photographs of the, the site starting 
over here really is the 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 age of the site is an existing hard and fence. Maggie, apologies yeah. for interrupting. Is there any chance that you can go on and, and show the slideshow rather bring it up in, in a yeah, yeah, no. it's it's bigger? Oh. Okay, you see that? Yeah, that's ah, grand. Well, thanks. Well, okay, right. So, we'll uh, I'll go on the slide free there again, if that's okay. Um, slide free, we have um, photographs here on you know, showing the extent of the site, and some of you may be familiar with the, the existing steps or two sets of steps uh, leading down from the car park. Uh, currently, there's a pod and fence separate in the car park. From the steps down to the river, and then you'll see the boathouse itself. Uh, again, here's some images of the car park and the pod and fence and the, the boathouse. Um, so sort the of proposed plans are set out. Um, these will show that it proposed sections of the, the platform. There's a circle in here is a, a left shaft platform to meet the DDA requirements because of level differences between the car park. Uh, and the gangway down to the proposed pontoon. Uh, this is a shower area. This is the second main element. And then you have the, the gangway down to the platform. Through all in here, and we have a platform windows parts. Um, this is probably a better image um, to give you an idea. Um, so it's a bird's eye view of the proposal. Again, the three main elements. You have the sort of enclosed um, Platform left area, you know, for um, wheelchairs to get down from the car park level to the to this level. Um, this is the proposed uh, access and handrails going out towards the the pontoon itself. You've seen that area I'm circling out the shower area, uh, and again the the, the pontoon itself uh, on, on the rubber side. Again, here's an overhead view site plan. Um, the pad and fence is going to remain. Park, car park layout, there's some proposed uh, amendments to the layout, just but nothing major. So, um, there's a number of consultees uh, in, in this proposal. Um, we've consulted DF Road, they have no objections, subject to conditions. The Environmental Health Department have no concerns, provided standard conditions and informatives. Um, given the nature of the proposal and the potential impact on uh, the river foil. Um, ASSA and SAC, that we believe that NAEA and Shared Environmental Services were key consultees. So, um, the, so NED, the Natural Environment Division, they have uh, inspected the, the, the submitted biodiversity che checklist and the preliminary uh, construction environmental management plan supplied by the applicant by employer consultants. They're satisfied that the, the preliminary outline is and, and the proposed works are, are fine, subject to a condition that a final sample is submitted uh, at, at a construction stage. So they have no issues. SES have uh, assessed the habitats regulations, HRA element, and they're content that the with the assessment and the mitigation measures, and we believe that there'd be no impact on the, the protected areas under the habitat regs. Um, Locks Agency have no objections, and Rivers Agency requested a flood risk assessment given its proximity to the river. Um, there was some amendments to that flood risk assessment uh, in relation to levels. Um, uh, rivers were reconsulted and they're satisfied and have cleared the proposal. Um, in terms of policy context, we looked at the RDS, the Dairy Area Plan, um, policy EMV9 in particular, development of adjacent to rivers and water bodies. Um, policy R2, recreational use of the rubber foil. Look at SPPS, PPS2, in terms of nature, natural heritage, PPS3, PPS8, and PPS15. Suppose that the main issues, there's three main elements of the proposal um, shown in the, the original images that you have the pond for itself, um, the, the lift and the showers, which you know, there's, are very minor elements. But the, the pontoon itself is the, the assessment of the impact of that on the river uh, and any potential impact on any protected areas uh, associated with the river, including the SAC, SPAD, Ramsars, etc. 
So as, as did it before, we've went to the relevant consultees that all the expected reports have been submitted uh, in support of the application and the, the consultees are content. Again, we're basically flooding consultees and that our flood risk assessment has been submitted and they're content. Uh, there have been no objections received to the application. Uh, I suppose we've also considered the, the impact of a development you know, visually being adjacent to the river. Uh, and I suppose the use of it as well, would that be an acceptable use uh, and at that location? Um, so it is concluded that the proposal is in compliance with the relevant plan and policy from the area plan, the SPPS and relevant plan and policy statements. I stated that there's been no objections received. There's no objections from consultees. We believe the proposal will be a positive provision of additional uh, recreation water related facilities at Braham Boat House and will be uh, compliance with the, the aims of the area plan and PPS 8 and the SPPS in that respect. So we see it as a as positive addition. And uh, therefore, the proposal is recommended for approval subject to the conditions set out in the case of report. Thank you. Moggy, um, any questions, members? Chair, can I come on? Yeah, go on ahead, Sean. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I'd just like to thank Moggy for the report and just to welcome it. Um, it's a really good report and it's a really good positive contribution for the Brahan area. Um, it's a great development area and it's a really good addition for the existing boating house and the boat club down there. And the pontoon is going to open up that side of the river. For sports development and for water-based activities uh, like the boating club and for triathlon and various other um, activities and um, i know that there is plans there's a redevelopment brief and council are ready for the boathouse that's currently going on at the moment so um it's really good that there's no environmental impact uh coming from it and um, if anybody else is content i'd be happy to propose this so thank you chair thank you Thank you, Councillor Money. Um, Councillor Mellon. Thank you, Chair. Um, just like the previous speaker, um, thank you for the report, Maliki. Um, I'm happy to second the proposal to accept the officer's recommendations. I do think it is a, a positive contribution to the recreational activities within that area. I know many months ago, um, being in the boat twice, learning different skills around the water, um, loving activities uh, and life skills. So I, I do remember fondly and any development of the site in terms of recreational activities for the users, um, for the groups as mentioned before, is to be welcome. So thanks again, Maliki. Um, any further comments, members? There, just I had my name in yeah, the chat. Yeah, um, just, I was going to second it, but obviously it's already been done. Just to welcome it. I mean, it's an excellent, excellent uh, proposal, as we would expect from council. It's a very, very positive contribution to the area, and uh, just something to um, to be associated with it. Really, really happy to see this coming before us. Thank you. Thanks, Sorry. Um Councillor Harga. Yeah, I just want to take the opportunity to add my uh, support for this. And uh, it's good to be able to be positive about something at this meeting. And uh, be uh, uh, so I think that this is a great development for the river, for, for the Prahan area. And uh, I think I want to commend all the people who have uh, worked to see this uh, project uh, taken to this stage. So uh, good to see it happening. And, and I'm sure everybody will vote for it. Um, any other comments, members, before I call the vote? Um, we have a proposal from Councillor Mooney, seconded by Councillor Mellon. Um, members, everybody spoke in support of this application, so I'm assuming that it's unanimous. Members, is there any dissenting voices? No? Members, that was unanimous. and. Just on that application, I know we spoke earlier um, about the value of amenity um, and 
I know somebody who spent quite a large, uh, the, the Prahem Boat House was uh, a big part of my childhood. Um, I'd grown up living in the water side. And to me, it's, this is the first step in terms of bringing it back into use and, and increasing the water-based activities um, at that location because it is, it's a sad, it's a sad sight to see what it is now in respect to what it used to be because as Councillor Mellon had alluded to, it was, it, it attracted groups from far and wide um, and it was a big part of the local community. So it's a very positive, um, very positive step council and um, I'm glad that it's got the full endorsement of this committee. Um, sure, could I just uh, speak on that as well? Okay, briefly, Councillor McKinney, go ahead. Councillor McKinney. Thank you, Chair. As, a, as an ex-member of the Foil Sailing Club, I was always concerned that we had no amenities below the bridge. And this will be very welcome for dinghy sailors, etc. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Philip. Members, our next application is um, Appendix 6. It's LA 11 2018 0372. It's a reserve matters application um, for a local distributor road. And it's Andre, which one to take us to it? It's over the right. Good afternoon, members. Uh, this application is LA 11 2018 0372 RM. And it's for a local distributor road in accordance with the requirements of approval A2005-02170. And it's lands at H1B, Phase 1 East, southeast of Barrahill Road and north of Skag Link Road, Galia and Derry. And the recommendation is to approve. So this is a site location plan members. Um, and it shows the proposed distributor road. The road is to with the roundabouts to the east and west and the existing Skag Road. And this new road will run parallel to the Skag Road within the housing zoning H1B. This is an aerial view of the wider area. As you can see from this map, part of the road infrastructure has already been completed. And this new road under this application will continue the provision of access into the zoned housing lands to the north of the Skag Road. So members, the zoned housing lands has the benefit of outline planning permission, which was granted in 2016. And this was accompanied by a section 76 legal agreement. The outline planning permission and concept master plan as shown in this slide, shows the provision of this local distributor road. And this is in order to facilitate the necessary main road infrastructure to facilitate residential, community, educational, and open space development associated with these land, lands. The main local distributor road will run parallel to the Skag Road and will be accessed via the existing roundabouts on the Skag Road. The road is shown in orange on this map, just located here. So as stated previously, the approved outline permission accompanied by a Section 76 legal agreement, which contains obligations in relation to the local distributor road. The approval of this application will allow the developer to meet these obligations when developing the wider zoning. So this application is only for a section of the overall distributor road in order to facilitate the zoning as shown in this slide. The small section to the west is already constructed with access to Barra Hill Road. The other section of the road to the east is under construction as approved as part of a reserve matters approval for housing development. The application is also accompanied with full private streets determination roads details as shown in this slide. And DFI roads have no objections 
and are content to adopt the road when constructed. This slide is just a photograph showing the existing portion of the distributor road between the Skag Link and the Bear Hill Road, which will link up with the application proposal. So this is a summary of the consultations received during the processing of the application. So Environmental Health Department, Locks Agency, SES, NI Water, DFI Roads, HED Archaeology and Built Heritage, DFI Rivers, and NIEA were all consulted on the application and have no objections to the proposed development subject to conditions and informatives. So in summary, members, the proposal is considered acceptable and that it is in accordance with the Dairy Area Plan 2011 and all other material considerations. The proposed road is located on zoned housing land, which has outline approval granted in 2016 for a new residential neighbourhood. The development is in line with the approved comprehensive master plan for the H1B zoning and the Section 76 legal agreement. The proposal meets all relevant planning policy, which is detailed in your planning report, and all relevant consultees have no objection to the development. No representations were received during the processing of the application, and therefore the officer's recommendation is to approve the application. Thank you. Three members, any questions or comments, officer? Councillor Mellon. Can you see me or can you hear me, Chair? Can you hear me okay? Go on ahead, Aileen. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking to see um, for clarity um, where the road breaks off into in terms of H1B. Is it in the outskirts of where the housing developments are going to be, or is it going to run on through if it has a distribution road? So the application, the, the road is partly completed up to the junction with Barra Hill Road. And this particular proposal will continue that road and then link up to another part of the distribution road, which has been approved under a different application. Yeah. Uh, See, so, so just in terms of the um, lands that have already been agreed and zoning around the H1B lands, um, is this a part of the originally approved zoning? So it was already in consultation with the steering group and um, uh, the ticks, the consults within that area? This would have been approved as part of the concept master plan, which was approved in 2016. Yeah. Under the outline planning application. Yeah, I've seen the, I've seen the master plan. I suppose it's for just for clarification for a question on down the road, but in terms of this road, that's fine. Thank you very much. I think I think I might be froze. No, it was um, just uh, I caught I caught I must end the your contribution, Eileen. Uh, Chair, sorry, it was just in terms of I was looking for clarity in terms of the master plan. Um I am aware of the master plan. I have no issue with the road, but I'm looking for clarity on the original zone and all the master plan. I've just got it that, that was within it and that's still what we're working towards. Um, and I'll be in touch with officers, officers and G course relating to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Councillor Mellon. Any other questions, members? Hey, come on, Angela. Yeah, go on ahead, Angela. Well, Chair, if there's no other questions uh, and nobody seems to want to talk and then I'll go ahead and accept the officer's recommendation for um, approval. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anybody want to second that? Yeah, 
Uh, I'll second that, uh, Chair John Boyd. Okay, members, is there is there any dissenting voices, any conflicting views? No. No, this is this is something that has it, it's a reserved matters one. It's something that has already been great, agreed prior, um, and there's no issues. So I'm going to take that as unanimous. If there's nobody coming on, we a dissenting voice. No, nope. members, that's unanimous. Um, so that application has been approved. Members, our next one is Appendix 8. Um, it's Members, um, the next one's Appendix 8. Um, I know Councillor Mellon has declared an interest in this. Um, so can I ask the ITD and invite Councillor Mellon to um, wait in the lobby and let us know whenever that's done. Oh, thank you. Um, our next application is Appendix 8, LA 11, 2020, 0219F. Um, it's, it's a proposed four-story extension to the northern side of uh, what, what would be known locally as Seagate. Um, um, and it's Sarah that's going to take us through that. Go on ahead, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Item 8 is LA 11, 2020, 0219F. F, and the proposal is a proposed four-storey extension to the northern side of the existing clean room facility to provide a new subfab clean room, recirc fan and plant room floor levels, including the provision of a new clean room link corridor bridge to the existing facility and alterations to the existing facility to provide a new clean lift and stairwell tower. And the site is at one dust drive Springtown Industrial State with a recommendation. So this is the site location plan. The site is located within the Seagate Technology Facility at Springtown Industrial Estate. It is located in the centre part of the site between the existing buildings. It occupies a gap between the rear of the factory buildings and comprises an area of hard standing, which is used for ancillary storage and circulation space around the existing buildings. This is an aerial photograph of the site and you will see from the photograph that the Ulster Science and Technology Park lies to the north of the site beyond the Seagate boundary. And there are three residential dwellings located immediately west, numbers 15, 17 and 19 Branch Road, and they abut the boundary of the wider Seagate complex. These dwellings are approximately 100 metres away from where the proposed extension will be located. This is an extract from the design and access statement, which just shows that the existing factory buildings range from three to four storey in height, and they will enclose the new proposed extension. This is a photograph of the app, and you'll see from the photograph the area of hard standing and the circulation space, and the proposed extension will be located between the two existing buildings in the photograph. This is a photograph of the front elevation taken within the site, and the proposed extension will be located again between in the gap there between the two existing buildings in the photograph. So one representation was received on behalf of the residents at numbers 15, 17 and 19 Branch Road. And the issues raised included health and safety, noise and where which it was queried if there would be additional noise levels and a question on monitoring, air pollution in which it was queried if monitoring of the existing extract systems had been carried out and if these would be available to the public. It was queried that in the event of a catastrophic event failure, what impact would there be on existing residential properties? And other issues such as overlooking, privacy, visual impact, environmental concerns and loss of property values. Officers consulted with environmental health with respect to the questions raised by the objector. Officers wrote to the objector in correspondence on the 5th of August, providing clarification on all of the concerns raised and a full consideration of the objections and the issues raised is set out in detail in your report. So this is the proposed site layout. The proposal is located in the northern part of the Seagate complex 
and is positioned to link directly to the existing processing buildings. It will provide another manufacturing line to operate alongside the existing plant. The extension includes 7,000 metres squared space over four floor levels. A new clean room link corridor bridge to the existing facility and alterations to the existing facility to provide a new lift and stairwell tower. This is the existing contextual elevations. And this now shows you the proposed contextual elevations. The building will steps up to, from the existing building and will be four storey in height, approximately 24 meters. It is positioned within the established footprint of the existing buildings. The agent has advised that there is a specific internal environment for the proposed use, and it is necessary to service the need for the new subfab clean room and the plant room floor levels. This is just a, another um, slide showing the proposed elevations, and the external fabric will comprise of aluminium cladding, light grey in colour, to tie in with the existing buildings. This just shows you the proposed subfloor plan, which is on the left hand side of the slide, and the level one floor plan. And then we have the level two floor plan, which will be the fan room, and the level three floor plan, which is the plant room. And then there's also a roof plan proposed. And this is a cross section through the proposal, which shows all four levels. So, in summary of the consultations, regulation unit considered a preliminary risk assessment and had no objections subject to conditions. Water management unit of no objections. Environmental health considered a contamination report, a noise assessment, and an impact on air quality assessment. The concerns raised in the objection and queries regarding the impacts on residential amenity have been considered in detail by both environmental health and officers. Conditions have been provided regarding contamination, noise, and air quality in order to protect residential amenity. NI Water, DFA Rivers, Locks Agency, DFA Roads, and Shared Environmental Services have no objection. So in terms of policy assessment, this site is part of the larger Seagate Industrial Complex, and it is located on lands which are zoned for industry IND4 in the Dairy Area Plan 2011. The main policy consideration for economic development is policy PED1 of PPS4, and this proposal meets all of the criteria as set out in detail in your report. Policy PED9 is the general criteria for economic development. It is considered that this proposal is compatible with the surrounding land uses. The proposed extension will unfold a portion of hard standing between the existing buildings on the site. It will not harm the amenities of nearby residential amenity, and noise and air quality impacts have been assessed and considered, and environmental health have provided conditions in order to protect residential amenity. In terms of visual impact, the nearest properties on Branch Road are located 100 metres northwest of where the extension is to be located. And whilst it is higher than the existing buildings on site, the height, scale, massing, and location of the extension are considered appropriate to the site and context. The existing dwellings are also separated from the proposal by intervening vegetation, and officers consider there would be no adverse impact on residential amenity as there would be no windows as to cause any overlooking. There will be no impact on natural abrupt heritage, on flood risk. The proposal will not create a noise nuisance, and environmental health have provided conditions. And the proposal is also capable of dealing with emissions, and environmental health have provided a condition relating to emissions. And it should also be noted that emissions to air from Seagate are also regulated under the Pollution Prevention Control Regulations Permit. There's adequate access and servicing, and the layout and design are of a high quality. In terms of PPS 15, a drainage assessment was submitted and DFI Rivers provided a condition requiring a final drainage network design and drainage assessment to be submitted prior to commencement. DFI Roads have no objection and there are no impacts on ecology or European sites, so the recommendation is to approve. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, any questions, members? Chair, can I come on, <clears throat> Angela? Yeah, go on ahead, Angela. Thank you, Sarah. Can I just ask you a question? I, I, I have a feeling that you've actually said this uh, during your report, but the conditions with regard to air quality, um, who who's overseeing that? Um, 
and the conditions that, that environmental health have actually put on um, to Seagate, what do they sort of, what do they um, entail? What what are the conditions that they put them on, and who is going to oversee this? And I do apologise if you've already mentioned that, but um, I'm having a wee bit of bother with my sound here. Okay, through the chair. So in terms of air quality, the condition that has been provided by environmental health is that the developer shall carry out um, air dispersal modelling. And this would be done basically to assess what the existing emissions are on the site and what the likelihood or proposed emissions could be. So that will be carried out um, and a written report basically will be submitted to environmental health. So it's going to be monitored by environmental health. And this is to ensure that there would be no impact on the residential properties. Now, they've also provided, I know your question was just about air quality, but they've also provided conditions as well in relation to noise. So they have put a noise level rating condition on and um, have asked for a post completion noise assessment, and that's just an extra protection measure as well to ensure that there would be no impact from noise on the existing residents there at Branch Road. Hey, um, you content, Enza? More question. I'm sorry, Sarah. How, uh, and I'm glad that you said that you have a post uh, completion um, noise assessment to be, to be completed, but can I ask the the air quality, I, I know that the residents down there have raised issues in the past with regard to Seagate. Um, can I ask how often is, is this done annually? Is it, go, is it going to be done biannually? Um, just have you any idea, Sarah? It may not be in your remit. Um, environmental Health haven't actually given me that information, but they have assured us that you know, the, the air quality and the air modelling is also protected through the pollution prevention guidance permit. So I'm hoping that there would be no issues then, and it is something environmental health also clarified, and I wrote back to the objector, that there will be monitoring done. I just don't know how often it would be done, but I can, you know, check that out with environmental health if you wish. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thanks, Chair. Okay, Angela. Um, any other questions, members? Or any comments at all? Chair, uh, I'd propose the application if everything's okay. Okay. Thanks, Councillor McGuire. Um, anybody else? Councillor Boyd? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, just again, just to formally second uh, the proposal as presented um, uh, by uh, Councillor McGuire. Obviously, it requires that. Okay. Um, is there any anybody with a disagreement and disagreement with the proposal, or can I take that as unanimous? No. Members, I'm going to take that as unanimous. So that's that the application has been approved, um, which is proposed by Councillor McGuire, seconded by Councillor Boyle. Um, so members, that's, that completes our applications for today. So I'm gonna move on now to item number nine, which is open for decision. Um, and it's the Donegal um, County Council local development plan and I'm I'm glad to see Councillor Mellon's back in now. So um can I hand over to Prances to take us through that? Um thank you Chair. Um uh has a consultation letter has been received members uh from Donegal County Council. Uh it regards the strategic environmental appraisal and the uh, appropriate assessment uh, screening reports that they have done um, regarding three proposed road schemes in County Donegal. Um, a response 
um, is sought before the close of consultation, uh, actually before this evening, before the 4th of November. So um, we've received, we received this um, a few weeks ago, just. Um, as members will see in the report, uh, there are three major uh, pieces of roads infrastructure are proposed, uh, namely the um, N15 to bypass Bally Buffet and Stone Order in the south of the county, um, the N13 near Letterkenny, uh, near the major junction um, where you come down from Derry uh, and up from Straban. So they're to redo that whole junction there and that section towards Letterkenny itself. And um, probably most significantly, uh, a new road uh, on the N14 from near Letterkenny to um, Lifford, Straban, um, it would join up with a new link on the new A5 at a bridge across from uh, Straban. So these are the three roads which are proposed. The Council has done pr two previous submissions uh, on the 17th of June and the 10th of August related to uh, the early stages of these um, consultations. Um, on the 13th of October, this council received a further consultation, this current one. Um, this is a technical consultation rather than on the roads themselves. It's on the SEA and the appropriate assessment uh, for the roads and specifically to do with a variation that the council is proposing to make to its county development plan. So uh, the council has done a screening report for the SEA, um, the environmental assessment, and also a screening report for the appropriate assessment. And they have concluded that there would be uh, significant environmental effects uh, from these uh, projects, or that there's potential to be significant environmental effects. Uh, and with regards to the appropriate assessment, that there are potential to have significant environmental effects on the European sites, particularly the river foil and tributaries. And because of that, they have uh, proposed and they, are, uh, they have said that they intend to carry out full environmental assessment and appropriate assessment reports on these schemes. Um, so, uh, Members will see that the recommendation is that uh, that there would be a, a letter um, submitted from this council uh, regarding um, those two um, uh, technical assessments. Uh, members will see in the in the in the letter that basically um, the council is supportive of the overall roads and the infrastructure uh, as part of the northwest region, um, and that we are aware that these roads are coming and they've been in the pipeline for some time. Uh, we have then added specific comments just regarding the appropriate assessment and this the SEA uh, of comments that uh, would be helpful to be included within both of the two reports. Um, so uh, with members' agreement, um, um, and if we're happy enough with that letter, uh, we would propose that the uh, that, uh, this letter would be uh, issued uh, forthwith to Donegal County Council. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you, Francis. Um, Councillor Boyle, did you want to come on in on this one? Uh, just briefly, Chair, just to say that uh, I, um, you know, having looked through it, um, uh, I concur with the, the recommendations that come forward, and clearly this does need uh, somebody to propose it formally, so I'm happy to propose it formally. And, you know, without uh, over-egging it uh, a bit here, Chair, but all, we all know the importance of improved um, uh, uh, connectivity in the West, and uh, this, all of the all three of these projects here will be will be major boosts uh, in the years to come, and clearly be uh, important in the development, further development of our local economy and job creation, etc. So, um, uh, just to propose that we uh, send the letter in the form that it's been presented here. Thank you, um, Councillor Boyle. Any, I, I fully concur. Um, I just note that Councillor Gallagher is prepared to second your proposal. Um, any further comments, members? 
No. So we're content with our response to the, the, the Donegal County Council. Um, so I'm going to take all these unanimous members. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Members, this is item 10 on the agenda, and it is a paper to correct an inaccuracy which has been identified in minutes of a previous meeting of the Planning Committee. The meeting in question was held on the 3rd of July, 2019. And the uh, inaccuracy came to light um, whenever uh, we were doing reconciliation between the DFI database and our own database of decisions. Um, as the report states, members, uh, the uh, planning committee doesn't have the facility to change the record itself. Um, but if the committee um, sees fit and agrees this paper, then it would be a minute uh, uh, of record. Um, and a note could be put on the original uh, the original minutes to correct the inaccuracy. Um, and that really is the sum of it, members. So we're at, we are asking that members would approve that the, the minute can um, be uh, amended, or the note, sorry, noted and the amendment made um, when these minutes, the minutes of this meeting are ratified at full council. Thank you, Chair. Proposed, Chair. Uh, second that. Uh, I think we've lost the chair here. I can't see her here. Yeah, I'm still here. Here, Christopher. Yeah. Right, I'm okay. still here. Right, okay. I was just thinking I might actually jump on there. Um, no. Are we is that unanimous members? So that's proposed and seconded. And we're all in agreement. So um, I'm going to, at this stage, I'm going to, I know Francis is in a role, but um, I'm going to invite him back to take item 15. And it's uh, the re advertisement of the Fermanagh and Oma District Council Local Development Plan Strategy. Francis? Thank you, Chair. Uh, members, uh, Fermanagh and Oma District Council has written to this council uh, as an adjoining council, a consultation body, uh, regarding a consultation on proposed changes uh, that it intends to make to the. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Was that a confidential business? No. No, it wasn't, was it? Sorry. I think. Sorry, I think. Uh, through the chair, it was it was uh, at the outset the the uh, the chair agreed to take it out of confidential. Um, sorry to proceed. So uh, it's a series of proposed changes uh, to the Fermanagh uh, and Oma District Council's local development plan. Um, they're proposing to make a series of changes, and they have to do a consultation on that. Um, they had um, this uh, consultation runs from the 8th of October till the 3rd of December, and uh, they've asked for our response on that. Members will recall that there was a, a very similar uh, consultation uh, was uh, discussed by the planning committee at the start of September, and members uh, agreed to uh, issue a consult a response letter, which broadly said that this council was happy with the proposed changes. Uh, there was no further comment to add, and particularly that we had assessed them and really their, their impact on our district as an adjoining district. So we were happy enough with them. This um, consultation is broadly similar, but there were four uh, particular um, changes that they, that they wanted to make further to the previous consultation. Uh, they are listed here in the members' report, particularly they were to do with um, unconventional hydrocarbons. 
uh, that there was to be no change actually to the original uh, LDP policy, uh, sustainable drainage systems, um, a minor change to that, so that they extended it. Uh, there was to be some changes to uh, regarding renewable low low energy uh, transmissions, uh, particularly in the AOB, and there was a, a small change to affordable housing in the countryside. Um, it was decided that um, sorry members are. Officers have looked through these the sum of these changes, and uh, we're not concerned that any of them particularly impact upon our our district as such. Um, we have overall, uh, you'll see members that we've raised in there that it's important that uh, particularly regarding the area of outstanding natural beauty, which is um, a main part of our common area um, that we have an inter uh, a shared interest. It's important that we uh, continue to monitor any changes. And in the report, you'll see there that um, we had suggested that um, there should be continued coordination between the four councils of the AONB. And we'd suggested that we should have uh, possibly another meeting of the Sperrin Forum. Um, Members will recall that probably in 2017 and 2018, we had a series of meetings between officers and members of the four councils, and we discussed um, key issues around the AONB to ensure that we have a coordination. Um, further to the writing of this report, uh, we did write to the other four councils, and um, earlier this week, uh, the officers had um, officers of the four councils held a video meeting, at which we uh, we discussed and went through the various AONB policies and the representations as each of them had received, and uh, having considered them, I think the councils are satisfied that the approaches of all councils in the AONB are still broadly. Uh, consistent and compatible, though there are some changes or there are some differences in the approaches uh, of the four councils, not surprisingly. Um, from Ananoma have and Mid Ulster and ourselves have our draft plan strategies out and broadly similar proposal policies and approaches, but differences, some differences in the way we approach them. Um, Causeway Coast and Glens are still at the preferred option stage, so they're some way back uh, towards area LDP. Um, but overall, members felt, or sorry, officers felt uh, that we were reasonably happy with uh, a consistency of our approach, and the other councils didn't feel that there would be much benefit or in, that it was necessary to hold a further members meeting of the Sparren Forum at this stage. Um, of course, over the next two months, we will be uh, assessing any further representations that we receive regarding our um, current consultation, indeed counter representations. So if that situation changes, we can revisit it. Um, in, um, we have drafted a letter here that we propose to send, we suggest to send to Fermanagh and Oba District Council over the next few weeks before their deadline on the 4th of December. Uh, subject to um, minor changes there, uh, as opposed to be referring to a proposed uh, meeting of the Sparren Forum, we would refer to just that, uh, referring to our recent meeting of officers of the four councils, uh, if members are happy with that. Um, so. The recommendation is there too that we will issue uh, that consultation response to Fermanagh and Oma in the next couple of weeks. Happy to take any questions, members. Thank you, Prentice. Um, any questions, members? Or are we content with the approach suggested? Chair, can I come in? It's yeah, Councillor Kelly, go ahead. 
Uh, just a query in terms of the uh, officer meeting of the Sparrows Forum. Uh, is there any record <coughs> of that meeting, just in terms of, you know, the points of discussion? I'm not talking about it. I know an in-depth minute. Just the bullet points of what was discussed and agreed, or what was arrived at, uh, just before we would sign off and not having a sort of a wider forum meeting. Um, through the chair, uh, I will provide um, a note on that meeting. Certainly, um, um, the the meeting was literally yesterday afternoon, so that hasn't been done. But um, needless to say, the councils, the other councils, didn't. There was no appetite for uh, holding a, an extended uh, a members um, meet the the forum at this stage, given that we. Um, we're broadly happy that we are still are consistent, um, but certainly I will provide a note and can issue it to all members or to Councillor Kelly, particularly who sat on the forum. Are you content with that approach, Councillor Kelly? Percent sure that's fine. Uh, the, the note itself is not really uh, I just to find out what was discussed and agreed, or and you know broadly probably doesn't need it given that. Crunch is the same. We're still within the parameters of everything that was kind of agreed up to this point. So, uh, yeah, with that, you know, proviso, I'm, I'm happy to to uh, endorse or propose a recommendation. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments, members? No, we have a proposal from Councillor Kelly. They accept the recommendation. Are members content with that? No, as yeah, Councillor Gallagher, Councillor Gallagher, are you pretend? Are you content to second that proposal? Yes. So that's a proposal from Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Gallagher. Um, if there's no dissent on voices, I'm taking that's unanimous, members. So, thank you. Members, I need a proposal to go into confidential. Oh, chair. I'll second that, chair. Uh, okay, apologies. 